and he's fight clubbing himself, beating right. himself up with yes. various. So at this point, Kiefer Sutherland walked down a tunnel, stood still for a little while, <laughs> and punched himself in the dick. <laughs> that, that is what this okay, but he like kicked himself in the dick. How do you do <laughs> that? Oh, <laughs> release the well. First of all, River Dance. Second of all, release the delusion cut. Forget the Snyder cut. I want the delusion <laughs> cut where we just watch <laughs> Kiefer Sutherland. Fighting himself. Where's that cut? I mean, I, I think it's on various videos where he's jumping into Christmas <laughs> I trees. I was going to say that <laughs> it's the Christmas tree video. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to God awful movies, where each week we watch another terrible movie so you don't have to. I'm your host, Heath Enright. And I'm joined by the beautiful and talented Eli Bosnick. Eli, how's it going? I'm amazing, Heath. Okay. Just no qualifying statement. You're just amazing. Oh, you know why I'm amazing. Okay, no, all right, all right. <laughs> We're going to get to it. We also have veteran maskist and pentagrammy nominee for Atheist of the Year over at Scathing Atheist, Michael Marshall. Marsh, welcome back. Former, former Atheist of the Year because you welched on QED. Well, no, Big welcher. Talk about God pentagrammies on Scathing. <laughs> Fine, fine. Well, in that case, in retaliation, Eli, I'm rescinding your 2018 appearance at QED. That never <laughs> happened now. Well done. Nobody wants to go to England in February, Marsh. Nobody wants to go in, in, in February. Oh, so you're not going to come then? Oh, no, no, we no, we, we're totally coming. gonna go. There's just unless you ban us, but like, which, please don't ban us. Don't ban us. Well, I'm, well, I'm, I might ban you. I might ban you. Really we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep that in the back pocket just in I case. I want to go to England in February. So, Marsh, <laughs> what are we going to be breaking down today? Uh, we watched Flatliners. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> it's, it's, it is. It is superb. It's the story of a group of cocky med school students trying to prove what happens after you die by not quite I dying. Not die. It's it's basically <laughs> this is whole this whole thing is it's like the near death experience equivalent of trying to see if the light stays on in the refrigerator when you shut the door <laughs> by opening the door again. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly correct. And Eli, how bad slash amazing was this movie? Well, if you ever wanted to do coke with Joe Schumacher in the 90s, but the guard at the front of the Natural History Museum was stronger than you thought he'd be, you <laughs> will love this movie. <laughs> and is there anything you'd like to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Oh, God, it's so much to choose from. I really wanted to go for the best worst location because we'll we'll get to this all the way throughout. Our notes are very confused about what building this takes place in. It's like, baffling. A, a med school, but there's dying patients there. <laughs> and there's also an extensive pre-Raphaelite collection <laughs> in there. So it's, Huge. It's, it's incredible. Tented and plastic <laughs> like museum pieces. <laughs> and, and I had that. That was going to be my best worst uh -huh. all the way through until we hit best worst dog injury. Yep. What's because, happening there? Ah, <laughs> uh, I mean, there was a point at which there was an injured dog and I wrote in my notes a joke about how the dog might have got injured and then seconds later that is exactly how the dog got injured <laughs> and it's the greatest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. I almost gave this best worst I make a joke in my notes and then it actually fucking <laughs> happens. <laughs> that happens a lot in a lot of movies. This one especially though. Yes. Speaking of which, Heath, what's your best word? Best, best Kiefer Sutherland getting beat up by a child. He gets <laughs> so good. beat up, he, a, a child, multiple times. It keeps happening mm. in this movie. A child shows up and beats the shit out of Kiefer yeah. Sutherland. And out of Kiefer Sutherland. Delightful. And the movie is so sure that it's scary or dramatic or anything but hilarious. It's hilarious. They are incorrect. Yeah, it's so funny. The, the first time when he just stands in front of Kiefer Sutherland for a tense moment and then kicks him in the nuts. It was impossible <laughs> not to laugh. Yeah, so good. I love it yeah. so hard. Every time he showed back up. And then again, I hate to spoil it, but like there's a moment where Keither Sutherland fights back and you just watch Keither Sutherland fight a child for a mm. while. A while? It's good stuff. It's pretty good. It's pretty good, my friends. It's it's sort of a bit like it's one of the latest series of 24 where the writers run out of ideas for who the terrorist would be. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a 10-year-old child this time. Okay. Stick with us. Okay. TikTok. Me meme culture. You're gonna this kid. He made a video where CNN is one of the things, and that I just stupid. Just, just don't question it. Just let Kiefer Sutherland torture him with a towel. <laughs> just, just let him go for it. And I'm gonna go with best worst use of Oliver Platt. Oh, it's sad. Emmy nominated, Tony nominated, Oscar I think nominated Oliver Platt. He should be. He's great. He's a great actor. He attempts 
to narrate this movie. Here's what my theory is. Oliver Platt was on set for this movie, like Julia Roberts and him were at like a Buffalo Wild Wings. And she was like, yeah, I got to go shoot this Schumacher movie. And he was like, can I come? And they caught him in one of the shots. And so he just tried to work himself ever more into the movie by like narrating it. And they were like, no. And then he was like, maybe I do something in the movie. And they were like, no, he is the, the Raphaelite art will do more things in this movie than fantastic <laughs> actor Oliver Platt. <laughs> Way more. Ah, uh, that's so true. Even to a point where the other actors tell him to not do the things that he's doing. He's like, he's narrating. They're going like, yeah, could you could you not be doing that? We, we got, we're filming a film here. Then they kept that in. Oliver, you're, you're an under five, man. Come on, stop it. I know you're Oliver Platt, but you... he just gets roasted the whole time. That's his entire, the whole time. entire role is just stand there and have other actors who are worse than you shit on you during the scene. Shit on him or for him to ruin the movie by being like, well, guys, that doesn't make any sense. Is that what this movie's about? <laughs> Glad I'm not in it. I'm Oliver Platt. All right. Well, I'm going to go watch some good Oliver Platt stuff. I don't know. I liked him in the West Wing for a little bit. He had that arc as the counsel for, for the White House. We're going to take a quick break while I do some of that. And then we'll be back to tell you all about Flatliners. So before we jump into the silliness tonight, we wanted to take a quick moment to remind you it's Matreon time. That's right. Once a year or every two years, as the case may be, we come to you hat in hand batted eyes turned upwards at your generous and beautiful face and ask you for your money. Money for scotch. Money for mango nectar. And of course, money for all the other uh, more important living stuff. So to start things off, we thought we'd hit you with a tune that we can promise will only leave your head when you give us money. Hit it, Anna. patreon.com slash god awful make a new pledge or upgrade your pledge by as little as one dollar and you'll help us hit goals like bible trivia debate class with andrew or marsh's accent extravaganza wait what yeah we don't know what that is either uh, but yeah. if we hit that goal it'll happen yep. see matreon.com for more details matreon give us your money Okay, Marsh, what if we just keep it super chill? Just you, me, Andy, hanging out, savory pies. I don't even have to tell Eli and Noah. Oh, really, Heath? From him, I expected it, but not from you. No more quip. No oh, more quip. Hey, Eli, what, what are you doing there? What, what's with the sign? I'm uh, protesting quip. You're protesting our sponsor? That seems like a very unwise financial choice. Yep. Yeah, well, mm. I'm sorry, guys. Quip has sold out. Of the product? No, no. They sold out like they went mainstream. I remember when Quip was a scrappy little toothbrush company with just a dream. And 
an ad on only our podcast. Uh, definitely never had an ad only on our podcast. That's not just on our podcast. Quip. But now they have nope. floss, a smart toothbrush, and they even have tooth saving gum. Wait, they sell gum. I know, right? So turns out Quip gum can actually help prevent cavities and freshen breath when chewed for 20 minutes after eating. It's sugar free and it has tooth friendly xylitol with zero calories. And to satisfy your taste buds, Quip added a long lasting mint flavor, crunchy tri layer design, and stamped it all with a classic Quip tongue. That sounds great, actually. It's not great. It's totally mainstream. I mean, the slim travel ready dispenser, which is available in five colors, metal or plastic, packs and protects up to 10 pieces of gum at a time. And it fits in just about any purse or pocket for on the go. In a world where we all need to be extra safe and hygienic, the quick release button means you can share with friends. No wrappers, hands, or hassles. Okay, and that's bad? You're saying that's all bad yeah, stuff? Yeah, Heath, what am I, a spaceman? I want my gum from an edgy newcomer, selling individual pieces on the street, not big tooth. Okay, cool. So if I didn't want my gum in single pieces on the street, would I give Quip a try? Would that be the move? Yeah, you would definitely want to right. do that. You can go to getquip.com slash awful right now and you get a free plastic dispenser with any refill plan. That's a free dispenser at getquip.com slash awful. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash awful. You can also find the Quip electric toothbrush, refillable floss, and more in the oral care aisle at your local Walmart. Quip, the good habits company. Okay, that sounds great, Eli. Count me in. No, you're supposed to go with someone hardcore. Who is it mainstream? Hey, I got a guy down at the bus station who makes his own brushes. You want his number? Very much. No. no yeah, I really don't. No, no. Oh, mm -hmm. but they're also knives, though, guys. They're also somehow even more no. Fine. And we're back. And the first thing I noticed, the credits had names of multiple real actors. Like we said, Oliver Platt, Julia Roberts, mm. Kiefer Sutherland, well, and also William Baldwin. So it yep. was not entirely, but yeah. <laughs> Hey, this is the 45 seconds that William Baldwin was hot, okay? This was the prime <laughs> of his life. We also got some music, which was fun. From the shot, we're, we're seeing the perspective of what seemed to be a pirate ship coming into Chicago. <laughs> and the music was telling me that this old-timey pirate ship sails up on a modern city and gets confused. So it was like, dum da ka dum ka go Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. my music note was, someone's got to fight this warehouse full of ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> but Kiefer Sutherland is there, so the pirates get that. They, they understand him with his ridiculous oversized duster coat that he insisted on wearing constantly in this movie. He did, and this is one of the first times we get a, the first look we get at any of the setting or, or the scenery. And it's the first thing that baffles me because you, he's just hanging around next to a giant statue entirely wrapped in cellophane. And I thought, <laughs> is this film set in like a weird dystopia where statues are better cared for than people? Because can you imagine what a world <laughs> like that would look like? <laughs> and then Kiefer Sutherland says... Today is a good day to die. And that's like the end of the opening scene. And I actually think that was kind of positive. Like you're having such a good time. Like you've done all the things you want and you're in a good place. Like, oh, maybe today I die. That's cool. Like that's, <laughs> that makes sense if you're a Christian and not a liar, I guess. But <laughs> I don't think there's that many people like that. See, I thought he just had watched the Christmas tree video and some kind of time travel scenario. And I got it. I understood. <laughs> I mean, I was just looking at his bleach blonde hair and I thought he was going to just go home and like touch up his roots. That's what I was thinking with the good, the, the good day to die. <laughs> oh, that makes way more sense. Works all sorts of ways. Yeah. 1990 movie. <laughs> so now we're going to cut over to the inside of the natural history slash fine arts museum slash medical <laughs> school that we mentioned at the beginning. And Kevin Bacon is a doctor and he's, He's treating someone who's having a bad crack trip. Yeah, something yeah. like that. <laughs> is that how crack works? This guy sort of very energetically sort of shouting and convulsing and things. Is that I, I've never been around a lot of crack, but it, it's not normally that, is it? <laughs> this was how 1990 understood crack for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Gotcha. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, is what happens in this scene, they're waiting for a doctor and Kevin Bacon, who's just a med student, is like, we don't have time. I'm going to do the surgery. And the nurses are like, oh, you are uh, not a doctor. And he's like, God damn it. Give me that scalpel. Yeah. And then he sort of fucking wings some surgery. That is exactly what happened. Yeah. yeah Kevin it's... Bacon doctors by his own rules and he just runs <laughs> in and like does all this stuff. And then he gets yelled at by Catholic 
hospital lady who's in charge there. And it's it's not the grizzled police chief yelling at, like, you broke all these fucking cars. You cost us millions of dollars for the city. It's this old Catholic lady being like, you can't just, you're not a doctor. You can't jump in on not surgery. You mm. can't do that. To be fair, though, if this movie wanted to win me even more than it will by the end, if he just instantly killed the patient, we don't have time. Just, <laughs> oh, right. Sorry, student. <laughs> But this is the thing that got me because it. I think it was even weirder than that because he's with the patient who's having a bad crack trip. The doctor who's with him says, we need some help. And so Kevin Bacon rushes out to get help, immediately runs into a trolley being pushed by 1990s Diego Maradona and then starts <laughs> to treat that patient instead. That's, it's like, what happened? Not, not only did you do this like weird <laughs> surgery 25 seconds after meeting a patient on a trolley without scrubbing up or anything like that. But also what happened to the guy who needed help who's waiting for you to come back with help? <laughs> yeah. like two patients. <laughs> oh, that guy died. That guy died because they didn't bring his blood bag. But the other guy who I improvised dirty handed surgery on, he mm. he also died of sepsis. But you know, now yeah, that I think yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this is why we don't let med students do, uh, do operations on people they've only just bumped into in the car. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Also, well, we're going to learn that Kevin Bacon is the evil atheist character in this movie. So I feel like this was an attempt to characterize him early with that too. Ooh, okay. I could see that angle. It's, this is a ridiculous anti-atheism theme running through this movie. And this is the beginning, I would say. Definitely. Yeah. So there is, but it's also super weird that Kevin Bacon is in this instant, the headstrong, just plays by his own rules, does things immediately without thinking character because... That is the exact opposite of the character he plays in the rest of this film when he's the one going, yes. guys, maybe yeah. we shouldn't do this. <laughs> in the rest of the movie. Why did you introduce him in this way? You've set the character up completely <laughs> backwards. Yeah, because the movie doesn't understand how to do the thing they tried to do because eventually mm. it's just like, oh, the atheism character is just being like super logical and they forget that that's bad to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now that Kevin Bacon has turned in his badge and scalpel, we're going to cut over the sick ward and we realize that Julia Roberts is in this movie? Yep. Oh, she's too good for everything. My notes, I was so enraged here. I was like, Keith, you want me to make fun of Julia Roberts? Big mistake. Big mistake. <laughs> Huge. No, I, I, I support. She's amazing. Perhaps you forgot, Heath right? that a cornerstone of our job here is blank, looks like blank, made a blank. Julia Roberts, Heath. Julia Roberts, think. <laughs> But the thing is, to be fair, she is a very serious character in this because if you look at her in this scene, she is doing a very serious I'm wearing glasses face. She's got a very <laughs> I'm wearing glasses face that she does throughout this uh, scene. <laughs> also, she's talking to a lady who is obviously going to be a crazy religious lady. And I saw it and I thought, oh, that's the lady who plays a crazy religious lady in absolutely everything. And I Googled <laughs> crazy religious lady actress. And as she came yeah. up, it's Beth Grant, she's called. Her wiki page opens with, she's known for often playing conservatives and religious zealots. It was right there on a wiki page. There you page. go. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beth has got a fucking genre. Good for her. Mm. And so what has happened in this scene, and this is going to pay out in a fucking beautiful way. The scene itself is hilarious and we'll get to that. But the like journey that it sends Julia Roberts on, I have deep and abiding philosophical questions about. But Julia Roberts is a med student who is curious about death for mysterious reasons. So she has gathered all the patients who almost died together for a little powwow for them to tell her their NDE experiences. Yeah. And the first one, the lady Marsh just described, who apparently plays conservative Christian lady and everything. Mm -hmm. She says, okay, so I floated to the light and I, I heard this beautiful voice and it said, I'm going to take your baby, but you're going back. And I was like, what the fuck happened? Like, I really want to see a brutally honest God doing that to people. I, I don't know what exactly that meant, but it sounds horrible the god just like <laughs> stole a baby and was like yeah no i'm killing the baby but you go back and get haunted by this for a while god just shuffles out from behind a pillar i'm sorry i meant for you to miscarry but then the game was on and then wow yeah <laughs> four <laughs> months later what would that mean <laughs> and it, it's so weird to specifically point out what a lovely voice the guy who stole your baby had that's such a weird <laughs> detail that's a weird note yeah that, that is a weird note think yeah. of that that's fair. now the second guy is the best though Mm. Second guy to talk is just like, yeah, I was legally dead for four and a half minutes. Um, no lights, no magic, no God voice. So it's just regular for me. I just almost died and then I didn't. <laughs> and Julia Roberts is like, okay, you're fucking up the movie. Uh, <laughs> Christian lady, you talk again. <laughs> but what's great is 
the person they chose for that is the only African American I'm going to say in the movie for the first hour and 20 minutes of this two hour movie. Yeah. So what the way the scene reads is white lady talking about her Jesus experience. You know, I was actually dead. Shut up, black guy. And then she literally <laughs> leaves the scene. Yep. She does. And she leaves the scene to be questioned as to why she's uh, like, what, why do you keep talking to the patients about death? And I thought that's not really the question. The question should be, why are you gathering random patients together to share their I hallucinated while under stories? That's the bigger <laughs> question to ask. Look, the Natural History Museum needs us to put the whale back in the morning. You are wasting our precious time <laughs> here in the Natural History Museum. So... Now they're at autopsy class, and this is a movie, so it means that autopsy class is just, you know, med students randomly cutting into bodies willy-nilly. There's a teacher somewhere, but, you know, just pull shit out and throw it into jars. Oh, it's this, med school. This, this scene is, this is lovely. <laughs> this is one of the first times that I really thought, where the fuck is this film set? Because, yes, it's a med school, but... It's basically also an art museum. The walls are covered specifically with Rembrandt's the Anatomy Lessons of Dr. Nikias uh, Tulp. So that's what that it's an it's the, the Rembrandt <laughs> painting of an anatomy lesson. This school, this medical school has Rembrandt money, which is already interesting enough. And my theory here <laughs> is that there's a really pretentious university dean who blew the textbook budget on art. <laughs> and now they've got to use Rembrandt as the learning materials. It's got like, just look at what's, what's the guy in the rough doing? Is he, where, where's he put the knife? Come on, drain the humors like the painting, you <laughs> I idiot. Gonna, I, I was going to say, teach, I can't find the black bile. I feel like this isn't <laughs> going well. And this is where we will be introduced to a very important plot point, which is that there will not be a single named male character in this movie who does not sexually harass Julia Roberts. Yeah, yes. Every yeah. single one. Yep. The closest this movie gets to a horror movie is Julia Roberts' work environment. <laughs> <laughs> they think it's a horror movie, right? That's what the movie is going for. Maybe? Mm. I, Do they? It's Joel Schumacher... And this is post the success of Lost Boys. So I don't know. It strikes me as like, I feel like Joel Schumacher wore his lucky socks the day he shot Lost Boys. And for the rest of his life, he was like, was it this? Was it the toes of the socks? <laughs> this is the first of many attempts for him to be like, what did y'all like about Lost Boys? You all really liked Lost Boys, but you hated Batman forever. Why? Mm. I don't understand what you want from me. We want Kiefer Sutherland, apparently. Apparently. Yeah, this was his first <laughs> test. He was like, maybe you guys just like Kiefer Sutherland? No, you don't just no, like turns Kiefer out, No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so they sexually harass Julia Roberts for a little bit, but they, they want her to do the super secret medicine thing. And she says, oh, I don't want to be there while you kill yourself. Yeah, she's got no interest in watching Kiefer Sutherland kill himself. And I thought, yeah, same question, William Baldwin, though. Can you answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> Right, but that that's the plan. Kiefer Sutherland, that's the plot of the whole thing, is he's decided he's going to, like, sort of kill himself somehow, but he needs help of these very specific group of med students to yes. not quite die. They've got a very specific set of skills that are essential to his his plan. And we will later talk about what each of those uh, those students brings in terms of it's skills. nonsense <laughs> what they think medicine is. Some of them are less essential than others. Yes. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> and before we leave this scene, I know it's just a tiny moment, but I have to talk about the insane grading scheme <laughs> yes. that the teacher okay. announces. <laughs> Thank you. What the fuck? Uh, so the med school teacher walks in and she's like, hello, class, we're grading on a bell curve today. There's going to be <laughs> three A's, five B's, 10 C's, four D's or F's. And I feel like doctor stuff is absolute and not relative. <laughs> isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's just yeah. like, you do good doctoring or not. When the question is, is that the kidneys? <laughs> <laughs> but at least what we do find out is that we've got our five named characters. And of this class, four people have to get Fs. So at least they go out of their way to make the teacher's job very, very easy in this film. <laughs> they hand her a win. See, I was saying everyone could blow it, right? Because if three only three A's, five B's, ten C's, four D's, or an F, I'd just be like, all right, everybody shit on your corpse's chest, and there's a some percentage chance that you'll get an A. You have to give three of us an A, you said. <laughs> you it's have a curve. <laughs> okay. We all shat. Your what are you shit doing? was the cleanest. God, it's a bad system. <laughs> right. But then the movie direct immediately after I was like, that's not how it could possibly work. This med school doctor teacher corrects me and says like, just like the real world of doctoring, 
You're not competing against death. You're competing with other doctors. <laughs> no, no, you're not. no, you're no, not. no. Very the opposite of that. Actually, the only possible explanation for that line is that the actress read it backwards. That's the <laughs> <Maybe>. only physical. <laughs> Oh, so yeah, now we're going to get another scene of Kiefer Sutherland trying to convince the rest of the cast that to do this suicide and then bring me back to life plan. And the only other thing I want to touch on about this scene is that it's like a montage of him trying to convince each of them to help him. And as he's trying to convince Kevin Bacon, Kevin Bacon is escaping via a, a rope yeah. out of the window. He's repelling out of a bill, like they say, oh, he got a four month suspension from med school for doing something, maybe for do, being a surgeon out of nowhere when he wasn't supposed to. Mm. So he's repelling out of med school, like an escape. Yeah, you don't have to escape. Yeah, I feel I need to describe the picture as well for, for, for listeners who haven't seen this. So it just explains how baffling the setting is. Kevin Bacon is in the fourth floor window of a building that on the outside has a giant mural of a head on the outside painting it over the bricks and the windows with the word tough underneath. Not sure why. He's rappelling out of the window in full <laughs> rock climbing kit, including a <laughs> harness and everything, yep. while children, don't know why there are children at a med school, but children are running past, past smoking piles of leaves. And I thought, is this, is this after the revolution? Is this post-apocalyptic? <laughs> How did he get the rope up onto the roof? So he could rappel down from the fourth <laughs> floor window. Like that would have been a much more interesting scene than Keith Sutherland trying to convince his other friends to join him. Like, don't worry about them in the locker room talking about their cocks and how many balls they've got and all this kind of stuff. Just go to Kevin Bacon, <laughs> slowly trying to throw the rappel up onto the roof and get it to click onto the, the drain and then just testing that with his weight to make sure it can hold. Uh, eh. Eh. <laughs> I think Kevin Bacon was just trying to escape the cast, maybe, in real life. <laughs> they, caught, they caught him trying to escape the movie. <laughs> yeah. But in this conversation, while Keith is talking to him, he starts angrily untying the canvas cover of a military truck. Where the fuck are we? <laughs> the, yeah, again, I, <laughs> I, I don't know about you guys. I spent a tremendous amount of this movie being like, oh, they're in hell. Oh, they're in mm. purgatory. Just because Joel Schumacher, like rents seven different operas props for each movie that he's in <laughs> and just throws them all together for his props and scenery. And what Keith is saying as well to Kevin Bacon here is he can't do it without Kevin Bacon because he needs all the rest of them to put him under, but only Kevin Bacon can bring him back. And it's like Kevin Bacon's the only one who can resuscitate him. That makes the others really shitty doctors. If they yeah. can't bring, if they can't do CPR and use the paddles on, on someone, then they've not really been at med school very long. I feel like I can do both of those things. Like I learned CPR Absolutely. in gym class in school and I could press paddles and yell clear. I think that's all yeah. you have to do, right? Yeah. And, and even then Kevin Bacon does CPR wrong. We'll come to it. But when he's doing CPR, he goes like one, 1,000, two, 1,000. Three one thousand. It's like you know the reason you're saying one thousand there is to space out the numbers, so that right. doesn't work if you leave a gap after the one thousand. <laughs> oh, and I did enjoy Kevin Bacon's answer. He's just like, "Oh, you're gonna almost kill yourself, and then you're worried that you might, you know, actually die. just don't almost kill yourself, and then mm. you're not worried anymore. Don't die, then you're good." And but Kiefer Southern is like, "Okay, but what if it works? I would." at that point, have debunked atheism, right? <laughs> Kevin Bacon's like, you crazy son of a bitch. You son of a gun, you've, you've proven me wrong once again. We also get some shots of Billy Baldwin fucking here. Mm -hmm. He is filming himself and someone having sex secretly. It's 1990, so I'm very proud to say all of us were not sure whether or not the movie knew this was a sex crime. The movie does, actually. The movie, the movie is yeah. aware that mm. it is a sex crime. But it says a lot about the 90s that we were all like, man, I really hope this movie knows this is a sex crime and not an adorable character quirk. And there's, there's a ridiculous line in this as well, because as he's having sex with this lady, his phone rings and it goes to answer phone because it's the 90s. And someone says, hey, don't forget to bring the camera. And this lady says, what camera? And that's a weird line, because like if I'm having sex and I heard someone's 1990s answer phone message say, you know, bring the casserole dish, I wouldn't feel a need in that moment for more information. Like, Hang on, whoa, 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 let's just stop what you're doing there. Tell me about this casserole dish. Is this casserole dish aimed at us while we have sex? Because you have to tell me that. That is a sex crime, even though it's 1990. We know that now. Are we going to fuck the casserole? <laughs> So now we cut over to our Scooby-Doo mystery crew sneaking into the school to try their experiment. And I love 
Again, Oliver Platt is trying to figure out what the fuck he's doing in this movie. So now he's just roasting the concept of this movie and Billy Baldwin's character as they sneak in. Also, you've got Oliver Platt asking William Baldwin if he was filming himself having sex with someone. And I thought, was was he watching the previous scene? Like, he's just <laughs> on set watching the scenes, isn't he? Yeah. Either he was on set watching the scenes or Billy Baldwin, as I think we'll come to find out, pretty much just kills people, brings them back to life and films himself having sex with people. Yeah. Yeah. I think Oliver Platt was just like, were you recording sex with a woman without telling her like you always do? And he's like, I wish you wouldn't always guess right about that all the time. When, yeah, I mean, yes, I was in this particular case, but now we're doing the other thing I do, which we're going to kill somebody. Let's go. <laughs> and this is where he goes over his plan, which is he's going to lower his body temperature Inject yeah. himself with sodium pentothal. Sodium pentothal, yeah. truth serum, as it was colloquially known. I really <laughs> right. want that to factor in. I really want people to start <laughs> giving up secrets. <laughs> also, uh, they say D5W is going to be involved. Mm -hmm. There's going to be an injection or a drip of D5. That's, I looked it up. I didn't know what that was, but I looked it up. That's sugar water. It's just like dextrose. It's, it's fucking simple syrup and they're trying to make it all science -y. Get out of here. Yeah. And he says, you know, I've got some chill D5W in the cooler and it sounds like he brought juice. Like, oh, you know, go, 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 grab yourself on, guys. We're going to be here for a while. Feel, feel free to help yourselves. Oh, did you salt the rim of these needles? That's lovely. <laughs> I love this for us. Just watching Billy Baldwin try to like poke a Capri Sun gets in his eye. I would have enjoyed that. <laughs> But yeah, he's going to freeze him and then they're going to zap him and then he'll be dead. And then they're going to do CPR on him to bring him back. And don't worry if, as Oliver Platt points out, that's fucking murder. He wrote a you didn't murder me letter for each of them. Yes. Yes, he did. I don't think that's a thing that exists. I don't think you can write a letter that's like murder doesn't count if murder happens here. You guys are cool. <laughs> I'm cool with this. I don't think you can do that. I, I really want the letter to say, William Baldwin killed me. Like, I, I carry one of those letters all the time anyway, just in case. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's an excellent prank. And, and this is where we find out their special skills. You know, we need all their special skills. So far, Julia Roberts' special skill has been talking to people who were ill once. Yep. That's the entirety of the skills that we've seen of her. And what William Baldwin will do with his special skills in this is hold a camera, which is a job that could have been performed by a tall stool. Yep. And even then, he's filming it like it's the alien autopsy footage, so he's not even very good at it. Nope, he's not. Yeah, they, they couldn't find a non-sex criminal to, to loan them a camera, so Billy Baldwin makes it into this movie. And just at the last minute before they're about to do it on their own, who shows up but Kevin Bacon, bad boy of medicine? And so as, as they put him under and stuff like this, right, you've got the, the doing the syringe thing. You've got to have the sodium pentothal, you've got to do the syringe. I love it when you see people do the syringe thing in films because they draw exactly 20 cc's of sodium pentothal and then they get all the air out by squirting about seven cc's just <laughs> off into the air. <laughs> it arcs out into the air. This is fine. Okay, fun fact about that. You laugh, Michael Marshall, but I was about six months into my child's life and dosing out Tylenol and medicine for my son with his little like baby Tylenol by squirting it just into the midair in our kitchen before my wife was like, hey, you don't have to do that. <laughs> so these movies, what? they leave a lasting impression. You weren't injecting your son's well, Yes, patient. thank you. What? No, luck luckily she got to me before the first time I tried to, to inject it to him. But I did genuinely keep trying to clear the air out of all of our like medicine syringes by squirting it randomly in Sorry. directions in our kitchen. You crushed up a Tylenol, cooked it in a spoon with water and pulled it into a <laughs> syringe that you were going to then put some amount into your child with that syringe and Anna caught you. That's what you just described? No, Heath, it comes in a grape-flavored liquid and I was spraying that grape-flavored liquid around my kitchen because I didn't know how to get rid of bubbles. Take okay. it serious. Yeah, and the grape flavoring obviously demonstrates to you that this is to go in your child's mouth and therefore if air gets in your child's mouth a bit probably fine yeah oh my god i literally didn't realize that it doesn't matter you, you thought bubbles. the air bubbles would be a problem with no. drinking you literally just heard me realize that air bubbles <laughs> wow are a not a problem when you're squirting just now sorry in this so i'm just calling you child know, protective you know when services babies, right now you know when babies after they've been fed like you typically put them over your shoulder and tap them on the back so that they burp. Only if they... <laughs> you know that's because they swallow air while they're <laughs> drinking and eating stuff. Like, one of the most famous things you do with babies is because 
they're used to having air bubbles and stuff. I, is, you're talking about hitting your kids? Eli's burping the kids' <laughs> blood vessels, just slapping <laughs> arms. <laughs> uh, next, you're going to tell me I didn't need to tie that rubber thing around his arm while I was doing <laughs> his medicine, too. <laughs> Yeah, he took his little belt off and then tied his belt around <laughs> yeah, his arm. Right, exactly. He's got to learn to do it himself eventually. <laughs> you need Julia Roberts to inject your child from now <laughs> yeah. on because she is specifically the best injector of all the time. Yeah. I thought it was school. weird to put grape flavoring between his toes, but you know, who am I to judge the medical <laughs> professional? So yeah, he dies. And this is where we get our first view of the afterlife, which in Kiefer Sutherland's case is children playing in, in a field, which then turns scary and there's a dog. Yeah. But then, yeah, they, they zap him and he comes back to life. Okay. So they're bringing him back, right? So first of all, as he's out, Julie Roberts is saying, you know, if he's out for a minute, he'll be completely, he'll have brain damage. That isn't true. One minute, that's not true. It's like five or six minutes, something like that. But she says 10 seconds in, she says, we're 10 seconds in, brain death. Now it's real. It's like, I hope she keeps up that approach after med school. Like she thinks the human body runs on the five second rule. <laughs> like still good, still good, still good. Oh, we got it. We got it. It's cool. It's good. Just blow it off. Wake him back up. Blow off his brain. It's fine. We've given him sodium uh, pentothal to put him out. They bring him back with sodium bicarbonate, which is baking, baking soda. soda. Yep, baking soda. So like, guys, he's a dead man, not a grass stain. It's, it's <laughs> not going to do it. Oh, come on. How good would it be though if they like put a little bit of vinegar in his mouth and he just explodes? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, guys, I think we're bad med students. <laughs> they also use the defibrillator here to br as part of bringing Kiefer Sutherland back. And they do the thing. It's like, clear, zap. All right, we got to crank it up. Clear, zap. Oh, no, still crank it up more. Based on every movie I've ever seen, just crank it up to the third thing and go right away with the third thing and you win. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So now we cut to inside the Asian grocery store. Yep. Uh, keep up, everybody, where the rest of them, the ones who didn't die, are bidding on who gets to die next. Yeah, they're bidding with time. So yeah. the, the bidding system is like, okay, I want to die next. Julia Roberts says she wants to die next year. And then William Baldwin is like, I will die for two minutes. And she's like, 210. He's like, 225. And that, that wins the dying bid. Yeah. So he gets to go next. I really wanted Billy Bolden to start like bidding against himself and just start putting <laughs> extra numbers. Like, guy, you can stop, you can stop. And also, so Kevin Bacon's like, what are you doing? That's crazy. We're not going to do it again. And that's when they start bidding. And so like, I don't think Kevin Bacon's reticence was that you weren't going to be out for long enough. He's like, nah, I can see that you were looking, Kevin Bacon. How about I make it way worse? Will that help? <laughs> <laughs> and Oliver Platt, again, trying to find his point in the movie here, just, he's like, why would we do it again? <laughs> Someone just needs to explain why we would do it again. And they're like three minutes and 45 seconds. And he's like, that's just a time. That's not an anything. <laughs> so meanwhile, while they're inside the Asian grocery store, yes, that's actually where they are. That's where the after party is. They, I mean, Kiefer Sutherland is snacks. in the multicolored neon lit alleyway outside imagining a dog. Yep. And we're watching. This is the beginning of Marsh's best worst. No. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah, where yeah. Kiefer Sutherland is seeing a what appears to be a disabled dog wearing pants. Yes. Am I am I wrong? Yeah, he's like it's a dog who's got um, sort of crippled back legs and he's sort of struggling to walk. But I don't know why he's in sort of pants, but sort of rotten pants, like the pants have kind of been on for ages and rotted away. But I was thinking, <laughs> oh God, please let this be that when he died and came back, he brought his dead dog with him. Please let him now be forever having to be like, accompanied by this dead dog everywhere. That would have been a great, like a bloody, like Turner and Hooch. Yeah. The sequel, but where you brought Hooch back. I was going to say, the monkey's paw curled in a single finger when you wrote that note, Marge. And this is supposed to be, I think, scary, but this dog is so obviously doing a trick and he's so excited, it very much spoils it. The dog's like, look at me, I'm doing the scoochie dance. I get a treat for this scoochie dance. And Joel Schumacher's like, scary alley. But the dog's just like, scoochie dance, scoochie dance. Gonna get him bacon strip, gonna get a bacon strip. It's fantastic. So now we cut over to Billy Baldwin admiring his sex tape collection. And I will say, it's substantial. So I'm no expert on this, right? But he's engaged. We've established that he's engaged. If you're engaged and you're also regularly filming yourself having sex with a woman, 
maybe don't label the tapes with those women's names and nope. then just leave them around. This is like the ultimate sort of uh, loaded gun on the mantelpiece. This is this is Chekhov's gun. This is always going to go off that your, your your fiance is definitely going to find this. And the engagement video is in the middle of the in videos. The of He's like, all right, let's see. The anal sex with Mary and then missionary with Susan. Oh, oh look, it's their engagement party. Oh, I was so worried I had taped over this cheating on her. So it's so good that I... <laughs> That's why I labeled it. <laughs> and, then, and then he, I guess he feels guilty and he calls his, at this point, fiance or wife. Are they married yet at this moment? So they're not married because she says we should have got married first, but she's in college at a sorority. So like, how old is she and how old are they meant to be? Because I've never got a handle really on how old any of these people are. No. But if she's a college in a sorority, does that not make her kind of like 20, 21? Yeah, yeah that'd be about right. It's very unclear because it's this is also a movie from the 90s when 47 year olds played college students. Mm. Yeah. William Baldwin's like 35. So whatever. Yeah. He's in med school, but he calls her up and he's like, hey, honey, uh, if anything ever happens to me, I just, um, you know what? Never mind. OK, bye. And she's like, dude, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Hangs up. And that's come the on. The <laughs> I wanted the phone to ring. He picks it up. Are you in a Joel Schumacher movie? Because It sounds like you're in a Joel Schumacher movie. <laughs> Is something going to happen in the movie, Billy Baldwin? No. <laughs> it's like a PSA. We'll spot the warning signs. You may be in a Joel Schumacher movie. <laughs> All right. Well, we may be in a Joel Schumacher movie. <laughs> so we're going to take another quick break, and then we'll be back with more Flatliners. So wait, why are we sneaking into Marsh's house again? Three words, Heath. Subliminal messaging. Oh, you're done? That's two words. No, check out these babies. These earbuds? Yeah, but they're not just any earbuds. They're Raycons. Whether you're listening to a podcast, music, or trying to program your friend's brain to uncancel a skeptical event, a pair of Raycon wireless earbuds in your ears can make all the difference. You get crisp, powerful beats at half the price of other premium audio brands. Okay, but you, you stick them in his ears. He's going to wake up. No! Raycons look great and they feel even better. They come in a range of cool colors and with the customizable gel tips included for comfortable in-ear fit. And Raycons are built to go wherever you go with quick and seamless Bluetooth pairing and compact charging case. In fact, Raycon sent us a pair to try and they were so comfortable and the sound was so good that Anna stole mine. Okay, those do sound good. How do I get a pair? Listen up. Uh, I'm, I'm listening. No, that's in the must reads. Uh, okay, proceed. Listen up. Raycon's offering 15% off all their products for our listeners. And here's what you got to do to get it. Go to buyraycon.com slash gam. There, you'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order. And it's such a good deal, you'll want to grab a pair to spare. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash gam. Buyraycon.com slash gam. Wait a second, Eli, which address did you pull for Marsh? Uh, the one for his skeptic group. Why? Eli, this is not Marsh's house. This is Andy Wilson's house. <gasps> no! Because no! he's a murderer. Hey, thanks for helping us out with our pitches for Matreon, Marsh. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. No no problem at all. Happy to contribute. Um, so have you got like a script or something? Oh, you know what? I forgot to send it to you, but uh, here you go. You can just read this like right on the spot, right? Um, I mean, can I not have a quick look first? Ah, You're going to so be fine. Easy, just go though, ahead and read right? it. It's just easy. go right it's into so it. Easy just to read straight in. Straight in. Okay. Okay. Fine. Right. Uh, we'll do this. Okay. Hi there. It's me, Michael Marshall, reminding you that this Matreon... If we get enough new and upgrading patrons, I'll uncancel QED. QED, Eli, there's, there's a literal pandemic on. Ah, Read the no, whole no, script. It it makes it's sense. fine. We got it covered. We got it covered. Just keep going. I, I know what you're thinking. Isn't there a pandemic? Oh, there we go. No problem, because this year, uncancelled QED is going to be held in my house. In what? Why are you inviting people to my home, Eli? The, the, the copy, copy just please. Read the copy. Just read the copy. Ah, it's got the answer since Professionalism. <laughs> but that's not all. Everyone who comes to QED will get a free COVID vaccine. Heath and Eli have been stealing them by wearing fake arms to mass vaccination sites, and we're all going to do shots of them. <sighs> That's not how you take a vaccine. I'm not, isn't that a crime? Stealing vaccines is a crime, right? Marsh, there's so I little the time right now. Just read the, the copy. Oh, my God. Read out fine, out. fine, fine. Head over to patreon.com forward slash godawful to pledge or increase your pledge today, or find out more details at matreon.com. That's matreon. Come to my house and do shots of vaccine with my cat. Thank you. I don't know why I said yes to this. Because you love us. Did you want to say something back at the end? 
Did you know I say anything? Mm. Just to confirm. I mean, I, I like recording with you. Like I do. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. When we left off, William Baldwin's engagement video was not also a sex tape. And I think we were all kind of disappointed. And then it gets even worse. Now we're watching William Baldwin having a very sexual dream about his birth. Mm. Is that? Ooh. I'm pretty sure what's happening. <laughs> yes. I imagine that the uh, filming script for this, these scenes were titled, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me clarify here. Everyone, when they die, they get their own little afterlife. Keith Sutherland, he ran through a field with some children. We're going to understand what that means. We're going to see Kevin Bacon's later. Spoiler alert, we'll see Julia Roberts's as well. Mm. But for the record, and of almost no consequence, Billy Baldwin's afterlife is being born and then his mom transitioning into all the women he fucked. Yeah. I mean, you don't really touch back on the whole being born and the mum thing, which felt like that could have been a really big plot point for <laughs> Billy Baldwin's character progression. But instead, we just see him in what is basically like another one of his sex tapes. When when his mum <laughs> right. was apparently friends with Cruella de Vil at some point, yeah. that's definitely a character which is definitely Cruella de Vil. Yeah, a lot to unpack about, I think, Billy Baldwin in real life. His very sexual birth then transitions into like a 1940s playboy with Cruella de Vil. There's a lot going on. Yeah. And it's one of those things like, you know how when you see feet in a Quentin Tarantino film, you know it's a sex thing for him. Mm-hmm. This scene, you're like, okay, Schumacher, we get it, man. You couldn't just, <laughs> couldn't buy this from a German firm somewhere. I feel like there were mail order catalogs you could have done this with, dude. You didn't have to put it in the movie. <laughs> and then they bring him back to life again. And the only reason I bring that up, and I, I genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, I hope we skip some of these bringing the person back to life, is they will have the exact same scene over and over <laughs> and over again in this movie. Can we bring him back to life? Hit me the shock paddles. Blech. Nope, not back to life yet. Should we huh. do the shock paddles? We do paddles it two more even times, more? probably, or we just go straight yeah, to the let's third do it setting. More. Okay. <laughs> but, nope, not that. I, but each time the movie's like, man, what suspense, right? And you're like, no, movie, this is the 87th brought back to life scene with the exact same <laughs> pattern. I was bored by the second one, which is this scene. Yeah. Mm, yeah, this is yeah, where Kevin absolutely. Bacon jumps in and he's like, let me do the CPR. I count better. That's my thing. Julia Roberts is the injecting person. I'm the <laughs> counter presser. Yeah, Kevin Bacon is the only one who can bring them back to life by doing very basic CPR semi-competently. <laughs> right. So now they're in an abandoned 1950s diner where Billy Baldwin <laughs> is explaining his experience to them. The movie will never acknowledge that the diner is empty from the 1950s abandoned and that there is a single waitress who spends the entire scene wandering back and forth in the foreground in front of the movie camera. (laughs) This diner waitress hates all of them and I love her. She's great. She can't stand anything that's happening. Yeah, This is like when all the theater kids would go out after the show to Denny's and just order coffees. This lady got (laughs) imported from all of those Denny's to do this scene and hate these actors. So the thing is, they say to him, like, you know, so what was it like? They said to Billy Baldwin, what was it like? And he says, you know, great. Didn't they say define great? And I want him to say, you know, there were boobs everywhere, but in black and white, so it was classy like, you know. <laughs> he actually says class. He's like, I don't want you to think this was like, you know, tawdry. Mm. This was a classy childbirth sexual experience with older women that I was having. It's very classy. There was a feminine presence. It was a yeah. feminist NDE that I had. It's feminine. He said it, was, it, was, it wasn't casually sexual. It was vaguely feminine and like dozens of women in their laundry is more than vaguely feminine. (laughs) (laughs) And there's also this great moment where he's like, he's like, yeah, there were women in lingerie. It was deeply erotic. And you could see Kiefer Sutherland being like, oh, fuck, I got kids running through a field. Can we do me again? I want (laughs) sexy birth fuck. Yeah, but you're assuming that that wasn't deeply erotic for Kiefer Sutherland. Yeah, exactly. You don't know what he's into. <laughs> really wanted him to get nervous. Yeah, mine was erotic too. Um, but I don't want to talk about it. Oh, oh, get nervous the other way. Like, uh, yeah, no, mine wasn't erotic at all. Mine de- <laughs> definitely was not. Or I was not even slightly aroused by what I saw. You guys ever get into a fight in a hockey game as a kid with one of the other kids in like a section? No, no, never mind. No, you back <laughs> to uh, Billy Baldwin's thing. And again, Kevin Bacon coming in with the atheist hypothesis here. He's like, counter hypothesis. 
you're liars. And I was like, nope, that is that is not the atheist <laughs> position. <laughs> and the thing is, aren't the rest of them atheists? Because none of them show any signs of religion at all. But let's keep pointing out that he's the atheist. But none of them even mention any kind of religion at all. We do get a very prominent Jesus moment, though. Yeah, we'll, we'll get true. there. That is true. So, yeah. yeah, but yes, I agree. They, they, they're all doctors and they are yeah. logical people, except when they're not. Yeah, it's ridiculous. They actually say at this point, they're like, so Kevin Bacon, you're a you're an atheist. You got nothing to lose by dying, right? Why don't you just die next? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that's the atheist experience. Just nothing matters. Uh, just enjoying my decaying carbon over here. Maybe I die tomorrow. Who the fuck cares? That's atheism. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Yeah, I know for certain that well, I'm fairly confident there's nothing following this life and therefore there's no reason for me to not die immediately. That's, <laughs> right, that's that's how they describe it here. Yes. And again, Oliver Platt breaking the movie, he's like, a third person? Why would a third person be more information? Can yeah. anyone, can you see me? <laughs> if Oliver Platt was a ghost, this movie makes a ton of sense. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like what you don't know is that one of them went out earlier. They flatlined before the film started and Oliver Platt is the one haunting them. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. To apologize to her. That's what's happened. So much better. Oh, God. Do you remember when we had that uh, student friend, Oliver Platt, and we just refused to listen to him? Every time he said something really <laughs> sensible, we just didn't pay any attention to him. I need to apologize to him for that. <laughs> That's my sin. I love that they yell back at Oliver Platt here. They're like, we can't turn back now. And he's like, why not? Yeah, what are we not? going towards? It's not turning. It's just we don't kill anybody anymore. We just stop. <laughs> why are they outbidding each other? Why do they think it needs to be longer? Did they not, like, did it not work? It worked for Keith <laughs> Sutherland at the time he did. William Baldwin went longer. That also worked, not to a higher degree, to the same degree. So why do they need to go longer? <laughs> I really want, want them to be like, in the bidding war, they're like, right, 20 minutes. Yes, I win. Come on. <laughs> Forever. And he just shoots himself in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Also, so, right. if you're bidding on how long you can stay dead, I feel like going up in increments of 10 seconds is not a good bidding strategy. Go one at a time. Because 10's <laughs> quite a while when you start to add them up. It should be maybe a blind auction scenario where you write Ooh, down numbers. Oh, yeah. And, love that. I don't know. But then you got the asshole who was like, I put in 45 minutes. I didn't know how much dead I should be. Is that long? <laughs> oh, that seems long. <laughs> they just write it in like vague numbers that you could turn upside down and change them and really interpret them differently. Yeah. Okay, but the answer to why they have to keep going, according to the movie, we're about to learn the answer is atheism is the control in this experiment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like Kevin Bacon needs to almost die to make sure that like even the atheist will see Jesus because that's for sure real. <laughs> So yeah, he outbids Julia Roberts. She storms out and then he follows her and they have a him sexually harassing her scene. <laughs> we also get more uh, anti-atheism here. Julia Roberts is like, okay, Kevin Bacon, the atheist, how do you explain people all over the world having NDEs and seeing the same things? And he's like, well, I mean, vague tunnel of light that's you can't see a tunnel of dark. So like the fact that's just nothing mostly that's everybody might say that that's dumb and brain damage. Just so we just to, to be clear, brain damage is part of it. Also, they don't like mm. the big problem is they don't. Yeah. Right. People see things that are relevant to their culture. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you always get it very culturally bound by where you're from. And thing is, on a on a real world global scale, that is absolutely true. But even in the universe of this movie, you've seen two near death experiences that were completely fucking different. One was kids in the field, <laughs> the other was birth and sexy ladies. Those aren't the same thing. So even off your own experiment, that doesn't follow. How come they were both inside a Joel Schumacher movie? then if they're not <laughs> identical. And his answer to it is like, you know, maybe the brain has some chemistry that does that. And she's like, no, no, you're reaching there. He's like, yeah, you're <laughs> reaching. It's definitely that there's an afterlife and God was doing is it. Is he reaching? <laughs> Isn't that literally the answer chemically, scientifically? Yeah, it is. Okay. And they're doctors. They're doctors. Right. They, they should know, know this. But also, you don't need to have a near-death experience to find out why your brain does a tunnel thing when you die. You just need to pass out, <laughs> Right. Or go to sleep on a weird night and you're like, oh, yeah, that weird brown roller coaster feeling. Yep, that's that's your brain shutting off. Yeah. Mm. So now Kiefer Sutherland is going to search for the horror parts of this horror movie. <laughs> and he's just walking through. I mean, he's walking through the Sistine Chapel. There's seedy alleys. At one point, a homeless lady delivers him a message from the afterlife he visited. Okay. Right. But first... 
there's a giant late night bicycle gang yep. that drives right through him and they never come back. What was that? Yeah. Yeah. I wrote down that uh, I hate, you know, he just walked right through the middle of the Tour de France. And I, I really <laughs> yeah. hate it when they have stages that aren't in France. You know, oh, it's a Tour de France, <laughs> but it's in Italy or York or post apocalyptic <laughs> Robocop Detroit as Keith Sutherland's clearly walking through. But yeah, so a homeless lady delivers him a message from the afterlife. They're mad at him for visiting and not signing the guest book, apparently. And then he's like, oh, that was unsettling. I guess I better, I don't know, walk around these creepy abandoned subway tunnels for a little while. That'll make me feel better. And it's it's so frustrating when you're walking home at, at night and it's dark and you take the wrong turn, you end up in Blade Runner. I've done it a million times. <laughs> it's so frustrating. Oh, man. Am I in Blade Runner? This is a disabled dog with pants again. This uh... Yes! He runs into the dog who is butt scooting forever for eternity, <laughs> apparently. At pace, at pace, because this dog really moves because he tries to follow him and this dog outpaces him. And there's lots of like, I reckon Joel Schumacher was really happy with himself here because there's lots of very heavy handed symbolism of him heading down a tunnel that has a light at the end of it. And that's, he's in a corridor and there's a light at the end of the corridor. And so he's, uh, Joel Schumacher, he was high fiving himself all the way through that scene. That, there's, you can't hear any of the original audio. They have to redub it because of the sound of him high fiving himself so hard while directing it. But here's what's going through Kiefer Sutherland's head. He's like, oh, it's uh, my maybe childhood dog who is now disabled and wears pants. Hey, buddy, Champ. His name's Champ. Hey, Champ, you, you, you're walking down a wet tunnel there that's abandoned. Mm -hmm. Let me follow you. And he follows the dog through this wet tunnel to the amazing high five light. Nailed it. And then he sees a kid yep. um, just hanging out in a wet tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing ever happens. The then kid the kid kicks him, kicks in, the him in the ball so and hard. punches him in the face. <laughs> it's so good because he walks up to him and there's just a slow, a moment of silent tension. And then the kid like, <laughs> punch, like kicks him in the dick. So, so hard. So good. Okay. <laughs> Surprise nut shot. I would like to propose to the jury that we spoil this part of the movie because it makes it so much more insane and funny. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. This child who just kicked him in the dick and punched him in the face, he killed as a child. When Kiefer Sutherland was a child, he chased this child up a tree, threw rocks at it. That child fell, hit a branch. That branch landed on his dog, broke his mm -hmm. dog's legs, and the mm -hmm. child died. So now that he has gone to the afterlife, this is the plot of the movie, my friends. Now that he has gone to the plot of the afterlife, Ghost Dog, I assume, came from like, fucking fire engine and and marrow bone heaven over to ghost child and was like hey do you want to fuck with my former owner i could like lure him into the subway and then you <laughs> kick him in the balls and little billy was like absolutely that is how i want to spend my afterlife great fucking plan the other thing i'd like to uh, that i propose we should spoil at this moment is what's really happening in this scene where he's getting beaten up by a child because as we later learn he'll be beaten up by a child by this child at other points but we'll see it from another angle and he's fight clubbing himself beating right. himself up with yes. various so at this point Kiefer Sutherland walked down a tunnel stood still for a little while <laughs> and punched himself in the dick <laughs> that, that is what this okay but he like kicked himself in the dick how do you do <laughs> oh, that <laughs> release the well first of all river dance second of all release the delusion cut forget the Snyder cut I want the delusion cut where we just watch <laughs> Heather Sutherland fighting himself. Where's that cut? I mean, I, I think it's on various videos where he's jumping into Christmas trees. <laughs> I was going to say that it's the Christmas tree video. <laughs> also, is. I have and will continue to accidentally call him Keither Sutherland throughout this. And I don't need your tweets. I don't know how to say words and I apologize <laughs> to no one. So now it's time to kill Kevin Bacon. They've settled on two minutes and 20 seconds. Yes. And so... When you're under, you remember that you see your biggest mistake. And I hope Kevin Bacon just sees Bernie Madoff. <laughs> <laughs> see, I wrote in my notes, Kevin Bacon's heaven. It just cuts to him not doing the woodsman. Just like, uh, I don't think this movie's very good. I don't want to do this one. <laughs> but his heaven is a mountain and then a fetus? Hmm. Is that meant to be him as the fetus? Because if so, it's like, yeah, you see, life does begin at conception. Or he's gone all the way back. Checkmate atheist. Also, if this was baby Kevin Bacon absorbing his own twin in utero, I'm we I'd be 100 percent here for it. 100 percent down for that. <laughs> yeah. That that's his sin. His sin is, oh shit, I absorbed my own twin. 
<laughs> He's got to apologize to like a tiny cluster of cells. But no, we do get a hint of what his sin is. And it is the second greatest thing about this movie. It will be a very, very angry little black girl. And she will come back later <laughs> in an extraordinary way. So now we cut back to Keith or Sutherland getting home. I only point the scene out because it's this big tense moment where he's like, oh, I hope a kid doesn't uh, show up and beat me up. And then the kid shows up and beats the <laughs> shit out of him and spits in his mouth. Yes. <laughs> the, kid, the ghost in this horror movie, Keith or Sutherland, Joel Schumacher, dark, moody, neon floor lights, right? And then the ghost of this movie hawks a loogie into Keith or Sutherland's mouth, my friends. It's so silly. It's so incredibly silly because they play it so tense. They're trying to ramp the tension up and then a 10-year-old spits in his mouth. He's like one step away from giving him a wet willy. I was going to say, this would be like if the girl from The Grudge gave you a purple nurple. And it's just like, ow, owie. Ow. So now we cut to Kevin Bacon waking up but Julia Roberts stayed the night to make sure he was okay. They did not fuck yet. She just stayed the night to make sure he was okay. And she's mad at him because he wants to go again. She wants to go. And he's like, ah, oh, you know, I believe in God now. Don't kill yourself for extra long. And she's like, no, I have some people I cared about who died. I need to check on them to make sure they're okay. Yeah. And she'll need exactly four minutes and 25 seconds to check on all those people. <laughs> I wanted her to get her wish. She doesn't, but I really wanted her just like show up in heaven and she's running around. Hey, grandma, you having a good time? Okay, cool. Hey, Uncle Larry, is, is everything cool here? Okay, one second, I gotta go check on my sister. My sister had cancer. Hey, hey, how's it going, Karen? Are you having a good time? Okay, good, 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 good. Oh, hey, there, she'll be bringing me back any second now. Just go straight to the third shocky thing. God damn it, it's close. <laughs> Or it's just her in heaven doing a ring around. So she's not even running around. It's just her with like an old school rotary phone. She's like, zzz, zzz, zzz. <laughs> hi, grandma. Okay, hang on. She's she, grandma, grandma, holding a bit to your mouth, grandma. Oh, God. <laughs> she did them in different order. I don't have time to talk about this next thing. I have to call somebody else. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we have a, another quick scene with old lady. And again, if this wasn't going to pay off my friends, I wouldn't bring it up again. But she's like, hello, Julia Roberts. I'm dying. Anything new and death related with you? And Julia Roberts is like, no, you're dying tonight. I mean, you. well, you are. So, hello, today. <laughs> <laughs> Julia Roberts just says, yeah, you are dying, but it's cool. My, um, my atheist friend had an NDE. He saw heaven with, like, Jesus for sure. So, you're good. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah, basically, Julia Roberts tells the old, old lady to just die already. And we were all thinking it. Every time we saw it, just die already. Even the voices in the old lady's head were telling it to die already. Yes. At this point, there's consensus. Kevin Bacon saw Jesus. So you want me to, like, just smother you? You're, uh, you're good? Well. <laughs> she starts to push on her face with a pillow. Oh, okay. Sorry, I got a, I got a mixed signal just now. <laughs> I thought you nodded. Felt like you nodded. <laughs> and now it's time for the second greatest scene on the train. Kevin Bacon is going to be roasted by a little black girl ghost. For a while. For it's pretty great. So long. So, okay. Sorry. I got to <laughs> set it up. I got to set it up. I'm getting ahead of myself. Kevin Bacon is on a train and then it goes through a tunnel and then a little black girl appears and insults him for an hour. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. And she absolutely rattles it off. She calls him Fellatio because his name is like Lucretio, Labratio or something like that. And then she just rattles through the insults. And you know what? Fair play to her. I've heard you guys do roasts for charity. It's not easy to keep coming up with insults, but she just powers through. She's not even phased when she starts running out of decent insults and starts going with like banana breath and tire merchant. At yep. one point she calls him a tire merchant. Does call him I a feel tire like she was merchant. put on the spot. Yep. I feel like she was starting to run out. Like tire merchant is just a job, kid. It's a perfectly <laughs> respectable job. But other than that, you've done well. Her intro is also very weird. Was that when she was like, hey, got a match? Yes, this is exactly what I'm okay. talking about. She says, got a match. And Kevin Bacon's like, I don't know what's happening right now. And she's like, well, I do. Your face in my ass. <laughs> what? I, I paused and laughed for a while because I wasn't ready. It was so good. <laughs> we should also point out that the tone of this movie until this point has been very serious, even with the loogie hawking child. So the fact that the movie screeches to a halt, literally and metaphorically, so that this girl can be like, fuck you, fuck you in the face. Fuck you, man, you fat ass piece of shit for <laughs> Ever, I was crying with laughter. I was crying, and it goes for so 
long. I just want, I wanted the rest of this two hour movie just to be this little girl insulting Kevin Bacon. Okay. <laughs> so at this point, we didn't know, like we spoiled it for you before, but we didn't know everything yet. So when I'm watching this, all I know is that this girl was introduced once as she plays some jump rope in Kevin Bacon's NDE. Hmm. And now she's showing up. So I'm like, oh, was she part of like a tragic jump rope incident as part of like <laughs> what happened there? I just I'm picturing Kevin Bacon getting all wrapped up in jump rope, trying to double dutch, hurting himself and like somehow grabbing her into it and they both get strangled. I don't know. I was laughing a lot for this entire scene, including that. It's all vulgarity for charity roasts moving forward. Top donor next year, we will just play this clip outside the window of anyone you ask us to. <laughs> so now it's time for Julia Roberts to die. Um, Kiefer Sutherland, who has apparently been getting the shit beaten out of him by an eight-year-old on the reg, like practically military crawls himself way in the door. He's got open <laughs> wounds and a rubber chicken sticking out of his ear. And they're like, hey, Kiefer Sutherland, get the shit beat out of you. And he's like, nope. I'm good. I'm good. Let's, I, uh, let's, let's kill Julia play, I, I play hockey sometimes, and a child hit me in the face over and over with the <laughs> stick. It's just, it's normal. Can we just do the thing? Right. So now it's time for her afterlife. And this is where the pattern of the movie breaks in a really weird way that I didn't understand. So again, if I may pull back the camera slightly for our podcast listeners, what this movie posits is... You do bad stuff karmically when you die or if you have an NDE, it comes back to haunt you. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. What Julia Roberts did karmically that's bad is her dad killed himself because she walked into the room when she was a child. Yes. That's, and that's all, all we know. know at this moment. Yeah, it's insane. Mm. And they won't. For, for the rest of my notes, I was like, that makes no sense. She didn't do anything <laughs> wrong. Why is she being haunted? It looked a little bit like, because he's got his back to her when she walks in, and it looked like he was wanking into the bathtub. And I thought, oh, is that what it is? And then he like runs out, <laughs> oh. and he's kind of like all scared, and I think he then like kills himself. And I thought, is he just really overreacting to like not having locked the door when he wanted to uh, have a, some alone time? I thought she just watched her dad taking a shit by accident, and that was like a mortal <laughs> sin, according to this movie. It's like, okay. don't see your dad shitting. <laughs> That's your fault if he kills himself right after that. What? To be fair, if anyone ever saw me shitting, I would also have to take my own life. That's for the best. But again, this is so this, this is the cl <laughs> classic Schumacher doesn't know what he's doing because she opens the door. He runs out. Mother's like, no. And then there's a gunshot and a car window with a hole in it. Did he go out, get in the car, and shoot himself in the car? It seems yes, that way. that's what they're saying. Yeah. But hasn't the car also crashed? Because it, it, it looked like it wasn't like the car. I, I wasn't paying enough attention to see where the car had moved. But I thought he drove away in the car and then shot himself. And I thought, is he driving? And he shot himself while he's driving. <laughs> and that's how he's crashed the car. Okay, so he, he got into the car, uh, rode it for like 10 feet, hoping that that crash would kill him. It didn't. And then he <laughs> shot himself. Okay, yeah, uh, that is that is the story the movie tells. That's us. what we see, right? Right. Yeah. Also, one other detail: Julia Roberts' NDE doesn't start with this immediately. It starts with extremely white Caucasian Jesus out of nowhere for no reason, and then she gets to see her dad <laughs> shitting or whatever. Yeah, I had it as uh, Ted Cruz Jesus. Yeah, very Ted, Ted Cruz Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> I just think it's kind of needy that Jesus had to show up first. And then he was like, okay, now you can see your haunty thing. About it. Like you said, me, me, I am Jesus here. Okay, go. It's not even Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus. Like, like Jesus couldn't be bothered to make it to her NDE experience. So he sent one of those like automatically signed eight by 10. <laughs> and actually you just reminded me the movie fucks this up. We see that exact painting of Jesus on the wall of her childhood house in a later version of this same flashback. Yes. So oh. they're just admitting that like, yeah, you see things that you've seen before sometimes. Because other than that, it would have been like Jesus is there on Skype, but he hasn't turned his camera on. So you're just getting his profile photo. He hasn't bothered. To, he, he hasn't done his hair. He wasn't looking right. He's just, you, you know, the profile photo. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. When you turn off your Zoom camera, everyone wonders if you're pooping. That's Jesus in this NDA. <laughs> 
And then they bring her back to life. Will they bring her back to life? Yes, they bring her back to life. Although I will point out, this is where they introduce Berkelium, the don't inject her injection, which they'll use mm. at the end of the movie. And the only reason I bring this up is Marsh. You have to get this drunk at QED. I need to, I, if I don't inject you with Berkelium, then you haven't fully committed to QED in February. Gotcha. So you, you do that while Heath is just next to next to you doing the Kevin Bacon thing of having amazing ability to bring someone back, which consists of saying, come back. <laughs> <laughs> come come back. Like just shouting clearly okay. in her ear. But this whole thing happens for another funny reason. I actually laughed. They're about to do the defibrillator again. And then the power in the building goes out. Mm. Oh, God, I forgot about and this. And they're like, yeah, oh. Because of, of the rain. Because of the rain. It oh, right. Because rain shuts down the power in most museums so they're like William Baldwin uh, did you charge the battery on the defibrillator and he's like shit <laughs> sorry uh, you had one job man one job was power up the battery he forgot and so this is when Kiefer Sutherland is like okay I'm injecting her with the poison br 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 beryllium thing or whatever and Kevin Bacon's like hey hey hey, hey don't inject her with poison <laughs> He's just like, sorry, I jumped the gun. I don't even know why we have a poison injection thing right here. That's crazy, right? Why did I fill a needle full of bleach before this session? That wouldn't have been good. Yeah. <laughs> but she makes it. She makes it. She somehow. makes it. Yeah. Even though she she's does. not shocked again, just Kevin Bacon shouts, come back. And so she goes like, oh, yeah, yeah, good point. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's time for Kevin Bacon to explain the plot of this movie. And it's like he's reading the script and dictating it to his agent. He's like, okay, so hear me out. When you die... If you were mean to a kid in elementary school, which I was, they they come back and they roast you. And I was like, oh, OK, so like you killed that little girl or she killed herself or something. And he's like, uh, I'm going to look her up and see if she's still alive. And I was like, OK, well, if she's still alive, this movie makes no fucking sense. Mm. Well, spoiler alert, this movie makes, this no, movie fucking makes sense. no fucking yeah. sense. How he's introducing it is great as well, because he's like, you know, guys, something strange happened to me on the train. Like. A little girl was like so mean, like so, so mean to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so yeah, that's his haunting experience. And then they go around the, you know, the, the, the group and they're like, hey, anybody else getting haunted by their past? And Billy Baldwin has to be like, yeah, it's mostly gross sexual misconduct on mine. I mean, oh. Kiefer, do you have, Kiefer, you go. You getting haunted? I wouldn't say I'm getting haunted so much as I'm getting me too'd by the afterlife. Does that make sense <laughs> to you guys? Does anybody have like a hockey demon that spat in their mouth, please? <laughs> and Kiva's like, Keith, yeah. He's so casual. He's like, oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm being haunted by the spirit of an eight-year-old kid. Uh, he beats me up some time. You know, NBD. It's not, a, it's not a big deal, guys. <laughs> okay. But the reaction that they wrote for the other characters, they're like, you got beat up by a child ghost and didn't tell us? And I'm like, <laughs> weird choice for an emotion. <laughs> <laughs> and all these doctors are immediately like, okay, but you, that's different. Yours with the hockey demons different. You really got beat up. I see your face. You look ridiculous. Obviously our sins have come to life. Science. So that's the plot of the movie from now on. Yeah. And they say, oh, but th that's not possible. And Keith Sutherland says, well, yeah, but this whole lab is impossible. It's like, <laughs> is the whole lab impossible? Because all you're doing is stopping someone's heart and then bringing it back again using a defibrillator, which happens in <laughs> ERs around the country regularly. That's real. Yeah, it's pretty. It's it's possible. It's it's plausible. It's probable. <laughs> okay, around the world with the defibrillators just made me think of this. So when you zap them, you have to yell clear. I'm assuming it's the same in every language. They say they yell clear, and the point is like nobody touch the person because you'll get zapped too. Is that why? Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that's why, but I don't know if they definitely always use clear. Do they not use like a local language? I don't imagine like in a hospital where you're not using English very often, you're going to use an English word for that because clear is get clear. Right. If you're saying a word that no one understands, then that's not going to do the job. Well, yeah, I'm assuming they would. Yeah, I'm assuming they would use the word of their their clear. language that means oh, right. clear. Sorry, I thought you meant they were always going to say clear. I they also thought no, that's what they've all seen saying. movies, so they say clear. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm that's guessing, what like, I thought you were saying too. Heath. I was but very no, confused. It might have been like a standardization thing of like you know doctors can come from all around the or lots of different countries. You know, the UK is full of, of doctors from parts of Europe, so you standardize it around a single word, and maybe they all teach that word. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm okay. I'm assuming they say the word clear in their language. So what, what I'm thinking is a French doctor would be like, Claire, but what if somebody named Claire is in that room? I feel like it gets confusing. Mm, yeah, that would, be a, that would be a problem. Or if you have German 
where it's like Schweiner honkend, right? I feel like the timing on that is weird because you got to well, wait. That's true. Although, isn't the German just Klar? <laughs> probably. Well, it's probably closer to Klar. <laughs> Because <laughs> Germans quite often say, oh, yeah, yeah, all is clear, as in all is, all is cleaner. Oh, okay, yeah. But otherwise, solid, absolutely solid. <laughs> <laughs> Klarinsky, if it's Russian. <laughs> right. So medical jargon aside, now we're going to cut to Keith or Sutherland. And it's like he's preparing for a final battle with the kid. He bars his door, like calling out the ghost kid. He's like, come on, you pussy. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely goading this dead child. It's amazing. <laughs> Feels like he's sued up. With your hockey pads at that point? I don't know. You've been beaten up a few times by this hockey kid. He spat in your mouth. Get maybe a face shield. I don't know. Yep. Really wanted Billy to appear behind him. Dude, I'm a ghost. Whack. Ah, God damn. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like act three does not need a hard sell because a child is going to beat up Kiefer Sutherland again. More. A bunch. <laughs> but first a quick break. And then we'll be back for the amazing conclusion of Flatliners. Clear. <gasps> like I told you not to put in the IV of mango nectar. Yeah, nope, that's fair, Marsh. That's fair. Okay, so Eli, did you see anything on the other side? Yeah, yeah, I did. Like a a bunch of people I bullied in high school were there. Yeah? Yeah. Like a lot. Like a lot. A lot. Like, yeah, and they all started at once, so I didn't really hear anything at first, but then after a little while, they all sort of spoke amongst themselves and, and they worked out a kind of take a number system. But even mm. then, it was a nightmare. Right. But did anyone mention a prank website? No, they did not. I guess mm. I was only dead for a few minutes because everybody, all the high school people, they got like three seconds of person. Three seconds. Yeah. Three seconds. Okay. Didn't, oh, I did get to see Matt Powell, though. <laughs> nice. Did you, uh, you apologize to Matt Powell? No, I told him to fuck himself. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Cool. And you're absolutely sure nobody said anything about prank websites. Marsh, if you wanted to turn, you should have gotten a lower number. Ha, <laughs> silly Michael. That's not how you declare bankruptcy. Oh, hey, Heath, what are you doing? Oh, hey, Marsh. Just watching my favorite show. What, again? Yeah, I mean, I was going to watch TV writers who haven't read Lovecraft or superheroes, but not again. But I don't know. feels kind of samey. Well, Heath, if, you, if you're looking for something new to watch, why don't you try Acon TV? Ooh. Watching a tree grow. I hear that's better than the old ladies who are sassy friends show. Oh, yeah, no, that's true. Watching a tree grow is way better than the old ladies who are sassy friends show completely. But no, mm. Acorn TV, it's the largest commercial free British streaming service that features compelling stories, exclusive premieres and originals you just won't find anywhere else. Uh, TV from not America. That doesn't sound possible. No, it, it is. It is. Like with Acorn mm. TV, there's always something new to discover. It's got hundreds of exclusive shows from all around the world, including award-winning mysteries, dramas, comedies, so much more than that. And Acorn TV, it's it got new releases every week. So you'll never have to worry about ever running out of content. They've got shows like Midsummer Murders and Line of Duty. And one of my favorite shows of all time, Slings and Arrows. It's a Canadian comedy about a Shakespeare troupe. Okay, that does sound good. But I don't know if I can afford another streaming service. Well, that's the best part. You get thousands of hours of new and thrilling content on Acorn TV for a fraction of the cost compared to more streaming services at just $5.99 a month. Plus, it's a breeze to watch on my iPad, iPhone, or even my Apple TV. If you're ready for a streaming service that offers new stories, new characters, and breathtaking sceneries every week, do what I did and get Acorn TV. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to Acorn TV and use our promo code AWFUL. But you have to enter the code in all lowercase letters. That's A-C-O-R-N dot TV code awful in lowercase letters to get your first 30 days for free. All right, I'm sold. Now, uh, you guys want to watch Marvel? Try to make minor characters interesting so they can make more movies now that everyone but ScarJo quit? Sure. Yeah, I guess so. And we're back. And the Flatliner gang is hanging out at Julie Roberts' apartment for her... NDE after party. They seem to like these. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And they're like, okay, everyone. So we've established the plot of the movie. We're being haunted by our pests. So Julia Roberts, if you see anything bad in your visions, let me know. Okay, bye. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, <laughs> Kevin Bacon stays here because, you know, they're supposed to be a love interest kind of thing going on here. And he's got a handful of books that he's going to read. One of them 
philosophy of death and dying. So he's reading this to like study up on the logistics of ghost revenge, which is now the plot. <laughs> yeah, this is from her like bedside table. I spotted this earlier because she's just got hundreds of books basically on a bedside table. And it's Death, the Final Frontier, Philosophy of Death and Dying, Death and Neurosis, Defining Death and Euthanasia. And like, <laughs> if you went home with Julia Roberts and that was her nightstand, you suddenly remember you had a really early meeting the next morning. Ah, uh, uh, disagree. Julia Roberts? <laughs> <laughs> she could have how to cook Eli Bosnick and I'd be like, eh. is it an afterwards situation or a before situation? Yeah, like a mantis thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> feel like that's a win for me. <laughs> now, question. OK, so just philosophical question uh, based on the universe of this movie. If you were a good person. Would you get haunted by like pleasant ghosts at this point Ooh. if you had an NDD? Yeah. So like the little girl you helped across the street would show up and like and just like high five you, give, give you, you a, cupcake. like your favorite food. Like, hey, I brought uh, pancakes or whatever. I don't know why I yeah, said pancakes. Like, That's not my if favorite. If that was food. the case, then that little girl, for the act of having been helped across the street, is doomed for eternity to be serving you pancakes. Which is her yeah. hell. Let's say waffles because they're better. That's just okay. exactly also, true. Would you have to scare her away by finding her as an adult and being mean to her? <laughs> <laughs> Which is what Kevin is like. Oh, hi, are you Cindy Grayson from the third grade? <laughs> there, they take that, you bitch. <laughs> Tell your soul to leave me alone. <laughs> See, these are the things they should have explored. Mm, these are the film. questions this movie is too scared to answer. Now, you remember how earlier... Before the commercial break, I told you that it would be funny if Kiefer Sutherland was sitting there waiting for the ghost and then the ghost just appeared from behind him and kicked his ass. <laughs> That's what happens in the movie now. Oh, and it's so good because at the start of the scene, we just have Kiefer Sutherland waking up fully clothed on the floor, brandishing a screwdriver, which is just a regular <laughs> Tuesday for Kiefer Sutherland. Yep. That is how most Tuesdays start for him. Absolutely. He, he's planning to kill a child that he bullied to death, we know now. <laughs> yes. He's planning to kill that child with a screwdriver. And can I just say, if this movie had ended in a final fight to the death between Kiefer Sutherland and a child, it is my favorite movie. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Just them, like, shirtless in the rain. I should have killed you when I had the chance, Billy. I should have killed you when I had the chance. <laughs> Stop but moving. Like, I'm spitting in your mouth again. Deal with it. <laughs> but Billy grabs the screwdriver off him and hits him so hard across the face with a screwdriver that it knocks him out. Yep. So that kid's really got an arm on him. Yeah. But like, <laughs> if this is the fight club thing, he's beating himself up with a screwdriver now. Yes, he is. Just again, show us that. <laughs> oh, that been Release the ghost cut. <laughs> so we cut over to Julia Roberts. She, of course, gets haunted by her dad. We all have dead dad pop scare. We all have that. Yeah. yeah. That's what happens in the movie. Dead, dead pop There's scare. A dead, dead pop scare. <laughs> but remember how I promised the old lady scene would pay off? When this happens, she runs to the old lady's hospital bed, presumably to be like, don't die. Anything bad is going to haunt you when you get there. Don't listen. <laughs> old lady, did you like kill your dad by seeing him shit? Or did you like hunt a child, <laughs> tree him, anything like that? It might not work out. So yeah. were you ever mean to a child once like 70 years ago? Because that's going to be your eternity now. This is fair. Have you been involved in a tragic jump rope incident? That is the other one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can die. Smother, smother, smother. No, oh, sorry. I, this keeps happening. Oh my God, you got to stop nodding. That's not... Well, it's better. She gets there and the old lady's dead and the nurse is like, yes, people die sometimes. And Julia Roberts is like, you don't fucking understand. Dying is bad. And the nurse is like, I, I know dying is bad. Mm. But how, okay. how far through med school are you to come across that information? <laughs> Listen, I got a B because of a curve. I didn't, it's... Uh... Dying right. is bad. I just saw it in a Rembrandt. It's, uh, I've only just seen that Rembrandt, which is why we've only just learned it. So now we cut over to Kevin Bacon. He, he's having a flashback of bullying the little girl at school. Right. He he had to physically go to, to the playground where he went to school as a kid to to have this flashback. Yep. To properly doodly do. Yeah. He, he doodly does at the scene of the doodly do to make it easier metaphysically, I suppose. Here's, here's a philosophical question as well, then. Let's say that Kevin Bacon, rather than bullying this little girl, actually bullied Billy Mahoney, who then got killed by Kiefer Sutherland. <laughs> does Billy haunt them both, or does the, the worst sin supersede and absolve? This is a great question. 
I definitely want to see the kid holding Kevin Bacon and Kiefer Sutherland <laughs> down and spitting into both their mouths. Right, exactly. He'd have, to, he'd have to beat up Kiefer Sutherland, but he'd only have to roast Kevin Bacon. <laughs> oh, oh right. No, yeah, it's, in, it has to match yeah. up. It has to match yeah. up. Yeah. doesn't make sense otherwise. Good point, Marsh. So now Billy Baldwin is going to face the consequences of his sex crimes. We should point out that, like, yes, Kiefer Sutherland technically killed his person, but it was an accident. Billy Baldwin has been doing sex crimes as an adult in the timeline of this movie. He has done by far the worst stuff. Oh, yeah. But his haunting is just going to be women being like, you shouldn't have filmed me while I was fucking okay. you. <laughs> yeah. They need to kick him in the dick. But yeah, that, absolutely. I was so excited because he walks into his apartment, right? And they're all like, they all like show up out of the corners. They're like, oh, baby, I got to show you I love you physically. Come on. I won't judge you. Right. They're all using his lines on him. And I was like, kick his ass. Kick his ass. Weren't you guys so excited for these ghost ladies to kick his ass? Yeah. yeah. Except that what they were saying was so tame and so straight down the lens of the camera, like cheating is bad doing sex crimes is bad. It felt like a PSA they show in a Christian school about having premarital sex. Like, oh, <laughs> right. here are the lines you use to pressure me into having sex with you and I didn't want to. This is this could happen to you too, teens. Yeah, it's like a <laughs> dare workbook thing, but for that. <laughs> did, okay, question though. Did all these women die somehow since? No. Ever since no. Billy Bolt? They're, they're alive? Yeah. Are, are, so alive. Th these are living people who are helping out other revenge ghosts? I think they are, so based on Little Black Girl, who we will learn is alive and well, mm -hmm. right? I think that your sins just take the form of the people you wronged, whether yes. or not they're alive. Oh, he's hallucinating alive people is what you're saying. Yeah, those, those women aren't really there. They're just, oh, they are They are his sins. So that's yeah. why he's like, that's not, that's not why he's like, Oh shit, you, you, I slept with you and then you died. That's weird. And then another one. Oh, you also died. That's weird. Also, it'd be strange it. for him to have slept with so many women who then quickly died afterwards. Yeah. That, yeah. Okay. That, 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 was on... what, that was what I was getting at. That was weird to me. Okay. That makes yeah. a little sense. So you think that the only crime, like he committed more than just the crime of filming them without their consent, but like, he then killed them afterwards. Yeah. That would have been, <laughs> been a twist <laughs> worth pointing out. Okay. So now we cut over to Kevin Bacon and he's doing the 90s Facebook and apologize thing. I wrote in my notes, I've been there, K-Bakes, I've been there. And so he calls little black girl's dad and he's like, hello, did you have a daughter? You did. Can I have her address and phone number? I can. Wonderful. Yeah, pre-cell phones were a weird time. So I'm a total stranger. <laughs> could, I let, could I have your daughter's number and, and home address? Absolutely. <laughs> He's like, did you have a daughter called Winnie Hicks? You do? And while you're at it, do you have a copy of Fly Fishing by J.R. Hartley? That's a very British reference you guys will not get, but that's a very famous advert in the UK for the LLP. <laughs> okay. Very, very famous advert. Good, good. Don't I gotta get you know Acorn what? TV. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> Our Acorn TV subscribers are loving that one. They're absolutely <laughs> loving it. And I love, he's about to go meet the, the girl who we now learn her name is Winnie. And Kiefer Sutherland's like, Hey man, can I come with you so an eight-year-old doesn't kick my ass? And he's like, yeah, you can come with me so an eight-year-old doesn't kick your ass. <laughs> then we have a quick scene where Julia Roberts is doing a autopsy and the body turns into her dad. And like the class is still going. The class that they're going to be graded weirdly on. They haven't gone to it. How much time has passed? They are all getting Fs from this class. <laughs> And again, we all have this in our notes. Why would her dad be mad at her for killing himself? Yeah. This is a big effort to like embody a corpse during a, a med school class just to be like, I was shitting in there. You're an asshole. Knock. <laughs> <laughs> you should have knocked. <laughs> so they, they drive up to Winnie's house. She lives in a gardening mansion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Kevin Bacon's like, I'm the only one in this next scene with Winnie, but if an eight-year-old ghost shows up to kick your ass, honk the horn, okay? And Kiefer Sutherland's like, yep. okay, cool. And the thing is, they, they drive like Kevin Bacon's Vietnam war truck, and they drive it through all this kind of wooded, foresty kind of area, and it looks like they're driving through, you know, Vietnam circa Robin Williams. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and it keeps cutting between Kevin Bacon going to see Winnie, and then Keith of Southern freaking out as we sort of get, get his his vehicle circled by the camera. And it looks like any second now he's about to be killed by the Viet Cong. But that's exactly what's happening <laughs> to Keith of Southern. Here. Weird moment. Insanely oversized Jeep for no reason. I, mm. I didn't get that. But that's what they got. And also, 
He's about to go inside. Kevin Bacon's like, you're not in the scene. I'm going in. And Kiefer Sutherland is like, what are you going to say? You're going to knock on the door and be like, hello, ma'am. Are you haunting me as a child form? <laughs> but that's what he does. He, yeah. He knocks on the door. <laughs> he comes out and he's like, hi. Hi. Uh, oh. That's my truck, my oversized truck. Uh, you see the bloodied up Nazi guy smoking a cigarette inside? Uh, okay. This is a bad start. Are you haunting me? <laughs> Can Ooh, I come inside? And she's like, yeah. Come inside. We'll talk about whether I'm haunting you. I really want the first thing that she was going to say to him to be just to call him a tire merchant. <laughs> like, oh, that stinks. That stinks. <laughs> oh, I thought you'd forgotten that one. But yeah, she invites him into her house, which again is the plant section of Home Depot. <laughs> it's giant. It's a giant greenhouse house. And he says to her, it looks like you've done well for yourself, which is an insane thing to say to a stranger. <laughs> it's an insane thing to say to a stranger who shows you their plant section of Home Depot house. <laughs> I've never been inside someone's a greenhouse and been like, so you got greenhouse money. <laughs> <laughs> and he tries to segue from that. He's like, greenhouse money, you're crushing it. Magnate of flowers, they're really nice. Sorry I bullied you. Can you forgive me out loud for that? I think <laughs> it has to be out loud. Can you touch a brooch at the same time right? as forgiving me? I'm not sure. <laughs> it's the best because she's like, nah, it's that's like a long time ago. I kind of do remember what you're talking about. Let's, but let's it's just forget about it. And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm pretty sure... The rule is you have to say this out loud. I forgive you. It's uh, it's a ghosty thing. Just say it out loud. <laughs> this scene is the ultimate anticlimax. And I literally physically experienced it. The only thing that is weirder than this scene and it's anticlimax is that I went through this exact same moment beat for beat in my hometown like three years into college. I ran into one of the kids I was mean to in high school, and I was like, you know what? Like, oh, I'm did like, he kick you in the dick? I went. Spit so in his mouth. what happened to me was this scene is I was like, Eli, you've you've done so much work. You've grown. And so I walked up to him and I was like, hey, Kyle, what's up? And he was like, oh, hey, Eli, how you doing? And I was like, I'm so sorry for how I treated you. And he was like, ah, it was high school. Don't worry about it. And I was like, no. I know what I did was wrong. And he was like, you seem to have created his exact words. You seem to have made this a whole thing in your mind. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what she says to him in the movie. Is. There could not be lower stakes. She was like, hey, it seems like you're trying to create stakes for the movie. I don't fucking care. People call each other names all the time. Bye, Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Yeah, and he he basically like passive aggressively bullies her into accepting his apology out loud. This is him. So like, she's does. not wants no part of it, and eventually she relents because she knows if she just says okay, the crazy person will leave. Yeah, yeah. Finally, she's like, "Hey, Kevin Bacon, as you're leaving, I forgive you. Thank you for that." And he's like, "No," and he, he's like, "No." Are you sure? Wait, Are you wait, wait. sure? Everybody heard that, right? She, that counts. Keithleton. She said that. She does not say, I forgive you. She says, thank you. And he says, Are you sure? And she stares at him in mystification. She's like, Yeah, I'm sure. Thank you. And then he leaves. <laughs> and that's the end of their relationship. Oh, yeah, right. He's, he's like, Okay, thank you. Counts out loud. Everybody heard that. that we're going <laughs> to say that counts. We're going to say that counts. Meanwhile, okay. I don't know if any of you all have seen the Chucky movies. But Kiefer <laughs> Sutherland is in a Chucky movie right now. We watch the little eight-year-old ghost scampering around outside the van. And then there's like a knock at the window. And who's there? And then he looks in the back. And then the kid pop scares him. And, and this is where we realize that he's been fighting himself the entire time. Which is incredible. Because it has, you know, the conclusion that he hit himself in the face with a screwdriver and a hockey stick and kicked himself in the nuts. But it also implies that... William Baldwin sexually harassing himself in that previous scene, <laughs> yep. which is a way better scene, just him walking up the stairs, sexually harassing himself out loud. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the best ghost cut. Come yeah. on, guys. Oh, I wrote in my notes at this point, it's just you. It's just you. You don't know how much sense this is going to make yet, Keith or Sutherland, but your greatest enemy is yourself, buddy. I don't want to spoil that for you right now. So now they go back to the dorm mural whatever place and uh kevin bacon explains that he's not being chased by a ghost he's fine <laughs> and this is where Kiefer sutherland gets mad he's like come on like oh you had a live person you just have to fucking apologize this is bullshit you're you know you guys are seeing things 
You apologize to some lady over there, Kevin Bacon. I had to stab myself in the face with a pickaxe just now as part of my thing. <laughs> Fuck all you guys. And then, literally, as he says that, he's like, I stabbed myself in the face. Oliver Platt's like, well, all my friends are really upset, so I'm having a bad weekend, too. And everyone's like, shut the fuck up, Oliver Platt. You didn't even die. You didn't yeah. even die. I mean, yeah, William Baldwin has a right go at him. And he's absolutely right because Oliver Platt is just total ballast in this film. He serves <laughs> zero purpose. And now, okay, this is so fucking crazy. In order for Keith or Sutherland to explain, I killed that kid, he is driven, get your heads wrapped around this, Billy Baldwin and Oliver Platt to the cemetery where Billy is buried. Okay, so the, Kiefer Sutherland, at this moment, I thought, okay, he's going to apologize to the grave of the kid that he hunted sure. and apparently killed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he gets there and he's just still being mean. He's like yelling at the kid. And Fuck he, you, Billy. Yeah, and he's he, he's yelling about how his life was bad. He's like, I had to go to a boarding school after I did that murder. Like, I thought we were even after that, and <laughs> apparently we're not. This is bullshit. I mean, fair play for him to make it to med school with such a disrupted childhood. That shows real dedication or, uh, you know, skill. So he's done well to rebuild his life after, after what was clearly a tragic beginning. <laughs> right. My mom took away my Game Boy, Billy. Do you know that mom took away my Game Boy? <laughs> 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 but what he realizes in this moment is that if he's going to apologize to Billy... He's got to die again and say sorry in afterlife person. In, ND, Why? in, the, in the NDE cornfield. Yeah. Why? Why? Because... Exactly. Why? That's not the pattern that's been established in the movie. No one understands why it would be that way, but apparently. And, and this is where we get My Best Worst, where we see what actually happened with him as a kid throwing rocks at Billy and Champ barking. And I, this is where I wrote, as a joke, I really want Billy to fall out of the tree and land on Champ. And seconds later, that's exactly <laughs> what fucking happened. That's what how happened. his dog dies. It's the greatest thing. Squashed by a falling child. Which, to be fair, <laughs> Champ should be haunting Billy, not fucking... <laughs> <laughs> I, wish they, I wish they had shown them putting weird dog pants on the dog at this moment, yeah. too. Yeah. To tie that together. <laughs> So, meanwhile, Julia Roberts and Kevin Bacon have had sex. Why? Their relationship hasn't grown. We have no reason to believe that they would mm -hmm. like each other, but they've had sex. Maybe they didn't have sex. Maybe they just had, were in the bed together. Got naked and got in the that bed That happens together. to people. Bit about a cuddle? <laughs> a little naked cuddle. QED 2022, everybody. <laughs> Marsh is off. We'll all be vaccinated then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That'll be one of the panels. <laughs> but now it's time for Julia Roberts to confront her ghost dad. And every time she sees her ghost dad and all the sort of flashbacks, all the hallucinations, he's always in a red room. And I just want it to be that he was just an amateur photographer and he's just developing. <laughs> and she's like, don't, don't come out. The developing fluid's out. You're going to oh, You've ruined these pictures. That's her sin. She ruined his pictures. <laughs> there you go. So much better. I thought maybe she needed to bring toilet paper in this moment because he was out of TP <laughs> and he was mad about that. I don't know. But it's, it's even dumber. She looks over his shoulder and he was doing heroin? He was doing heroin. Yeah. He was doing heroin. And what I really, really wanted, because this film was in the 90s, I really wanted her to have a, oh, thank fuck he was a druggie. He, he deserved to die. This is 1990. <laughs> yeah. Don't do oh, drugs, kids. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're allowed. Yeah. But this isn't a reveal. This doesn't matter. Like, when you watch this death scene originally, where you're like, I wonder why that guy ran out into the street. Oh, she saw him doing heroin. Like, this didn't solve anything for me. No, no it. she saw heroin that he was doing, and then he killed himself, and it, we're supposed to be like, oh, yeah, that is her fault. That's yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's, that's on her. That's on her. You never look at your dad's heroin while he's doing it. <laughs> it's like wrapping a hose wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's a good example. But yeah, so she patches it up with the ghost here by just like sneaking up on the ghost really slow in her hallucination and, and then being they like, hug. It's, uh, mm. can we hug? Can we hug out loud? Can you say we're good out loud as part of the hug? Like, but that solves it here. Which implies that ghost dad and correct me if I'm wrong here. Doesn't that imply that ghost dad is haunting her for a hug? 
that he was like, I'm going to inhabit yes. this autopsy <laughs> body she's working on. Hug, honey. Oh, she keeps running away. Like, his journey in the movie has been like, oh, great, I get to visit my kid because she had an NDA. Why does she keep freaking out? No, it would have made more <laughs> sense if she was like, I brought a little bit of heroin for you. And he was like, oh, okay. Yes, that is why nice. I'm taunting you. Great. Yes. Awesome. Oh, I, I want Kiefer Sutherland to try and hug Billy. That's the, that's the next scene. Is Billy's like <laughs> right. punching and kicking. He's like, ah. I thought at this point she was going to like try to go catch Kiefer Sutherland and be like, no, 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 it's good. All you have to do is just like, you know, treat a uh, hockey ghost like a squirrel, just really close and get a hug in there. <laughs> yeah. Just creep up on him. Maybe bring him some heroin. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's not clear how this all works. <laughs> just Billy hanging out with the dad. You know, man, the thing that people don't really get about James Blunt's music <laughs> is that he's singing to all of us for all of us. Okay, Billy. Okay. Bro, 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 bro. Shut okay. up, champ. Let's not pretend you need heroin so, to enjoy James Blunt. Okay. How dare you? But it helps. It helps. And <laughs> it helps absolutely, a lot from, of enjoyment. I will say this. I'm, I need I heroin to enjoy James Blunt. <laughs> <laughs> so now the cast is all back together. They're all worried because, damn it, Heather Sutherland is going to flatline without them. My friends, the entire conceit of the beginning of this movie was, I can't do this without you. <laughs> right. And now he's so going to do it without He's going to do it by himself. At this point, I was like, please let him have a giant Rube Goldberg device <laughs> of like <laughs> sodium pentothal and hot blanket and cold blanket and like lowering the paddles somehow. But it's got to be because there was the whole ritual of like you need an injection and then an uh, electric shock and that puts you out. And if he's going to go, if he's going to try and flatline without them, he doesn't have anyone to bring him back. At which point this is just suicide and all of the rest of that is completely superfluous because yeah. he's not going to be able to bring himself back he's not going to be alive to do it but he goes back to the spot okay so apparently they just left their nde almost murder kit laying there in the just middle of this lying room around yep in this museum also this is where he injects himself with what looks like a pint of whatever is in that syringe oh it takes God. him like five minutes to slowly push all the liquid into himself He's just like, mmm, grapey, grapey, grapey. This is good. <laughs> he injects an entire Mike's Hard Lemonade into his <laughs> arm. But yeah, so he goes back to the field with the running children. And he's a child again, but this time he's being chased by Billy. Right? I guess, but he's seeing Billy and he's not even flatlining at this point. So you don't need to be dead to see Billy. Again, you've undone the whole point of this. Yeah. That's uh, okay. <laughs> you know what? Some of this movie doesn't add up. I don't yeah. think yeah. some of this movie adds up scientifically. And I only have one other thing I want to talk to you about. So he has this moment. He's being chased. He's up in the tree. Billy throws the thing. He turns him to his adult self and then he falls and lands. Well, it, it, the kid Kiefer falls for about six or seven minutes. And then it turns into adult Kiefer who falls for like another 15 or 20 minutes before he finally, <laughs> it's, he's falling forever. And it is the silliest scene. It's a joy to watch adult Kiefer Sutherland pretending to be falling for a really, <laughs> lo really long time. It's great. <laughs> to run out of breath and be like, ah, 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 yeah, it's pretty great. Right. So this is when the rest of the crew races in and they realize that, that Kiefer basically flatlined himself solo somehow and they have to pull him back out right also when we don't give a fuck about Kiefer Sutherland's character by this point because he's been a dick throughout so it's like yeah if he dies fine we you, you, you're showing us something with no attention for someone we no longer care about <laughs> it would have been funny if they pulled him out too early to like apologize in the NDE world and he's just like come on fuck I almost apologized to the disabled dog and the other kid that I killed I have to go. You have to do it. Kill me again. We have yeah, to go. Like, back oh, again. God, I, I should have started with a kid. I went dog first. That was a mistake. <laughs> I mean, you've got to send me back. <laughs> but he he's still under when they run in and Julia Roberts runs in and she's like, I just talked to him somehow magically. I know it's been like nine minutes since he first did the thing. And then it gets up to finally like 12 minutes and they're trying but to revive him. It's been nine minutes. It, she said it's been nine minutes since he called me. And he called me from a phone booth outside of the museum. So then he had to like race through all the corridors and museum, set all of the equipment up, fill that massive syringe. And then he's been out 30 seconds tops by the time they get there. <laughs> yeah, it, was, was, it was a really through. fast Rube Goldberg machine to make that. He just <laughs> dove right in there. But now they're like, okay, it's been 12 minutes approximately that he's been under. And <laughs> they're like, uh, do we just give up and leave now? Mm. <laughs> and literally Oliver Platt's like, I'll call the cops. <laughs> yeah. 
Now we all have to flatline and apologize to Kiefer Sutherland. This, oh, is, uh, this is the this worst. Is exhausting. <laughs> He's going to haunt us. Okay, no more flatlining because he can't get to us unless we flatline. All right. Everyone worked out with their ghosts so far, right? <laughs> but yeah, they bring him back. They inject the right things. They paddle him. And this is, this is how stupidly written this movie is. They lean down to him, right? They're like, oh, what is it, Keither? And he's, and he's like, bah, 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 bah. and Billy Baldwin says, he said, it's not a good day to die. Oh, that is a rough line. That is, for that to be the last fucking line as well, that's the payoff of this entire two hour thing. I was, I was livid that that was the last line. Okay, well, <laughs> the last line is really a 15 minute pan shot of God paintings and yes. then the end. Yeah, the, the random Michelangelo's that they've got around. The one from the Sistine Chapel is what they've got at the med school. Amazing. Yeah. And Oliver Platt saying, thank you, Jesus. I'm no longer an atheist doctor. I'm a Jesus doctor. The end. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Almost exact quote. Okay. So final question before we wrap it up. If you were in the universe of the movie, who would haunt you if you flatline? Now, we already learned that Eli's answer is... Well, almost everyone he ever met during his entire childhood. But yeah, except for that guy I saw in Barnes and Noble. <laughs> <laughs> Including that time you like got kicked in the dick in a Barnes and Noble. Marsh, what about you? Who's haunting you? Um, I think pretty much everyone who witnessed me drunk on the Sunday night after QED. Th those are the people that are haunting me. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm haunting you right they're now. They're haunting me now. They're haunting <laughs> <Yeah>. me now. <laughs> we make you watch these movies. <laughs> now everyone knows why Marsh is on this show. It's all coming together. I should never have flatlined before you guys emailed me. That was the problem. <laughs> if you pledge enough, we will wake Marsh up from his death coma. And he can go back to skeptics with a K. <laughs> All right, well, that's going to do it for our review of Flatliners, but that's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we managed to find another bad movie out there somehow. So, Eli, what's on deck? Next week, we've got a controversial pick because a lot of people really like this movie and are like, oh, I don't know if you guys could do this one. So we'll be doing the Christian high school musical that is a week away. Really? This is controversial? <laughs> Yeah, a bunch of people emailed us this movie and they were like, I don't know, it's a pretty good musical. Can you do this one? Okay. And I was like, challenge accepted. Done. <laughs> All right. Well, with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 298 to a merciful close. Huge thanks to Marsh for joining us and being haunted by us, whatever you want to call it. Marsh, anything big? You know, anything big coming up you might want to announce? Anything like that? Uh, yeah. I've just been named the 1996 Humanist of the Year. Um, <laughs> a, a slot just opened up, so uh, that's, a, that's a win. Okay. Anything about QED, maybe? February, uh, the 4th to 6th of February 2022, we're going to be doing the next QED. It was going to be in October, but we're not sure. We can definitely do it in October. So we're, we're going ahead the, the February the 4th and uh, 4th to 6th of, uh, of 2022. Same place, McKeel Piccadilly Hotel, Manchester, We'll let you know when tickets are available and stuff, but get that in your diary. It is happening. Fantastic. And everybody who doesn't already know, this is the best conference the there best is. Conference I'm not just, you know, blowing smoke here. This is genuinely the best. If you can go to one conference, go to go to QED. It's go fantastic. To, go for Drunk Marsh on a Sunday <laughs> night. Cause now it's been built up. So Marsh has to be drunk on a Sunday night, which makes it better. So if you are in my marriage, you will realize that it's been built up, which means I cannot get that drunk on Sunday night. That has been very well established over a period of years now. That's been made very clear. All right, we're going to double hunt you or something. We'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. Can, All we right. get, can we get Nicola drunk enough that you're allowed to be drunk? That may be the only solution. That might yeah. be the only way. <laughs> All right. Also, of course, a big thanks to our Patreon donors for all the generosity. If you'd like to help support the show, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful, and that'll get you early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help us out by leaving us good reviews and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Needed, The Skeptocrat, and D&D Minus, available in all the podcast places. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Drafts on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer Morgan Clark and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Michael Marshall and Eli Bosnick, I'm Heath Enright, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Animal House clothes. 
flatline would coincidentally go on to accurately describe Kevin Bacon's bank balance after he met Bernie Madoff. <laughs> <laughs> the black market medical school inside the Vatican art collection was eventually discovered and disbanded. <laughs> Kevin Bacon was in Flatliners with William Baldwin, who was in Backdraft with Rebecca de Mornay, who was in The Three Musketeers with Kiefer Sutherland and Oliver Platt, who were also both in A Time to Kill with Samuel Jackson, who was in Pulp Fiction with Bruce Willis, who was in Ocean's 12 with Julia Roberts, who was in Flatliners with Kevin Bacon. Nailed oh, well it. done. Well <laughs> done. <laughs> back. That's how the game's played. It's supposed to be seven. It's not just find your way back. Well, it's, most people would say it's supposed to be six, and I did it in less, and I got all the games. There was, you're all very well, no, impressed. No, you did it in seven. It was seven spots. No, that's not how that works. Seven. I was literally holding up my fingers just now. No, yeah, you don't you, count. You count flatliners twice. Yeah, you don't count flatliners twice. Obviously, thank you. Of course, you, you count flatliners twice. The it's, it's, it's the degrees. Look, one, two. We'll do that. Keep this. Three. Keep this, <laughs> Morgan. Four, I want you to keep this in the podcast. Five, and six. No, one, <laughs> I mean, you, two, you, Marsh, you back me up. The seventh one. I, I think you don't, you don't count the starting one. No, you don't. You do. No, Why it, you count, the, the you count one? step from one to two as one. Yeah. Count them again. Jesus. You know how a marathon is like 26, 26 miles or something. You don't start at mile one. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. is, my, is my first line to Eli or to you, Heath? Who, is it Eli shouldn't have put the Ivy of Mango? You're talking to me, yeah. I think. Oh, it was me. Okay. Wait, no, I'm I'm doing the I'm the doctor who's zapping Eli. That's right. And then so Eli comes are you back out to because life because of the IV of mango nectar. Yeah, I thought I was dead because I put an IV of mango nectar in. Oh, myself. I thought you came back to life because we put an IV of mango nectar. No, because then it wouldn't have worked. But you do come back to life. You say gas. Correct. Back to life. Why would Marsh tell you not to do the thing that brought you back to life? Because he doesn't want you to live. That's, that's that's so weird. That's not the subtext I was going for. I, I read this way differently than you. <laughs> yeah, we just we're just very much at opposing goals here. Okay, <laughs> so Eli, officially, Marsh is talking to you after you gasp back to life. There, correct. And it's because you put an IV of mango nectar for yourself to get flatlined. Yes, and it gotcha. brought you back to life, and he's happy because of that. No, you you zapped him. You're saying clear. He gets zapped. The zap brings him back to life. It was the IV of mango nectar that put him out. That killed me. Yes, thank you. Got it. Oh, you died of mango. Okay. Right. That, that's, but, that's but again, the, to be clear, Marsh is happy that you're alive. I don't like how hard you're having a time with this. I don't, I don't understand the motivations of the characters. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we I think it can be left ambiguous. I think it can be left in. Okay. I, I don't. I, I can be like unmoved by his play. His it life unmoved. Or death. That's perfect. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Su if you could do aloof. like an Anthony Hopkins yeah. remains of the day performance, that would be great. Like, That's what, exactly what I was thinking. Does he not care? Great. Uh, because then we can bring to QED. Mm. Um, and then when he's <laughs> a <base. laughs> No, no. I was, I, was, I was listing out the rest of the sentence. That's yeah, totally. Amazing. September, February, whatever. Yeah. Uh, sounds amazing. Bring a baby to my yeah, convention. Yeah, definitely bring, bring a baby to the skeptical no, convention. That's a perfect idea. Well, I, you were, I was letting you finish the sentence. I'm polite. I want to meet your baby. Your baby yeah, can I've, definitely be there. I've, I've heard you let people finish sentence on me reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's interesting. No, tell me, me more about that. Me and, how would you, me and the lady how would you who respond in... to people who think it's unreasonable to bring a baby to a, a large scale event? Like, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> definitely do that. It will be it'll be well, amazing to see well, you. Oh, yeah, definitely. And totally. Let me get your MySpace. <laughs> we'll get back to you on that. I sincerely want to see you guys. I sincerely want to see your baby. You are you are killing me here. <laughs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.